in Ireland to get as full as possible an understanding you can do of the changes that are coming at the end of this year as Britain leaves the EU single market and customs union. Um, I feel it's very important that business's voice continues to be heard as the negotiations on the future trade agreement uh, reach their climax. I know from Carolyn Fairbairn, the head of the British equivalent of IBEC, the CBI, um, how important the bilateral dialogue has been between IBEC and the CBI and how both organisations have been lobbying hard their respective governments and the European Commission to ensure that we get as business friendly an outcome as is possible. So as well as working with IBEC on this event, I'd also like to thank my team within the embassy for all the work they've put into it and to thank our colleagues from the UK Civil Service, in particular the Border Protocol Delivery Group, uh, which is responsible within uh, Her Majesty's Government for preparing UK borders for the end of the transition period, which is obviously coming up at the end of this year and the changes that will take place thereafter. In addition to colleagues from BPDG, and you'll hear from the head of BPDG in a moment, we also have um, expert civil service colleagues from HMRC, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, from the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, from the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, from the Food Standards Agency and from the Department of Transport, all joining us today. And I'm sure that the Irish business representatives on the line will have good questions, perhaps difficult questions, um, for all of my colleagues. So please, as my mother would say, don't be shy in coming forward with your questions and comments. And we have a, an electronic chat bar where I see some people are already lodging comments, which is fantastic. In my first few weeks here in Dublin, I've been very impressed by the Irish government's comprehensive readiness campaign, the public part of it and the private part of it, and the outreach series they're doing for business. And we hope that what we're doing today um, from the British government's point of view will be a useful uh, complement to that. And we're happy to be joined today by colleagues from Irish Revenue, who along with their BPDG uh, British counterparts will be able to talk you through an end-to-end -end product journey, covering the requirements from each side of the process. I think this is the first time we've actually done this together, the two governments at this expert level. So that's a great innovation and I hope it will be of great use to our Irish business uh, participants today. I'm acutely conscious, of course, that we can't yet describe to you the final contours of the business landscape that you'll be facing in terms of trading with Great Britain from the end of the transitional period. None of us would want to be at that stage of uh, relative uncertainty so late in the process, but that's where we are. The good news is that the negotiations for a UK-EU free trade agreement are in an intensive phase. I was talking to some of those involved over the weekend and they're literally working night and day to hammer out the points of agreement and to seek to narrow the points of detail on precise legal texts. I think a deal is certainly in our mutual interest and nowhere does that apply more so than in Ireland given the complexities of the all-island economy and the need for constructive pragmatic implementation of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. So we're really looking and working really hard for a deal on the UK side and uh, as for the EU side, of course, it needs to be the right deal. Uh, but I'm confident that with goodwill and good sense, we can get to that right deal in the next few days and weeks. Of course, we already have the first phase of the deal, the withdrawal agreement signed last year, including the Ireland North Island Protocol and the Joint Committee, which is responsible for implementing how the protocol is uh, turned into practice, is making good progress, not least in the last few weeks. Again, there is intensive talk continuing to nail down the detail of all of that. I talked to one of the leading officials involved uh, just at the end of last week, and uh, he stressed that there is a really strong continuing commitment to getting that uh, put into place, to clarifying any of the remaining uh, ambiguities, and above all, to find a way that works for all the communities in Northern Ireland that respects the parameters and the principles of the Good Friday Agreement and, of course, of the protocol itself. And that is crucially important. And clearly, given the all island trade, that's crucially important for Irish business as well. And anything that IBEC can continue to do in terms of discrete lobbying of the European Commission uh, to encourage a constructive and pragmatic approach to implementation of the protocol would also be very welcome. So in that context, I'm delighted that today we're offering a session on North-South trade 
delivered by BPDG uh, in addition to our focus on east-west trade. Now, as you'll know, there are only 60 days left until the end of the transition period. Deal or no deal, on the 1st of January, the UK will have left the EU single market and the customs union. There'll be therefore new rules for trading with the UK, regardless of the outcome of the FTA negotiations. We recognise the need to give business as much guidance and support as we can, because the trading relationships, north and south, east and west, are crucial to both countries. Over £1 billion of trade each week flows across these islands. It's an extraordinary statistic. The UK exports as much to 5 million people in Ireland every year as we do to 1.3 billion people in China. Hundreds of thousands of jobs, your jobs, your employees' jobs, depend on that trade flowing as smoothly as possible. And goodness knows in these times, every single job matters. So today matters too. It's an opportunity for you to learn, to question, to query, to inform yourself and for our expert teams to help you navigate through the new landscape that will appear in just a couple of months time. So thank you for your participation today. Thank you for your support and your involvement. Thank you to British government colleagues, Irish government colleagues and to IBEC for taking part in today. I hope everyone has a really successful and informative day. And I'll now hand over to Stella Jarvis, the director of the UK's Border Patrol at Protocol rather and Delivery Group to, uh, to take us further into today's events. Thank you, Stella, and all your colleagues for everything you've contributed already today and uh, very best wishes for a successful day ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador. Uh, thanks for your kind introduction. I too am delighted. I think we're all delighted today that actually the technology is working apart from anything else. Um, but I'm, I'm really pleased to welcome you all uh, to the Border and Protocol Delivery Group Virtual Industry Day. It's a shame that we can't be with you in person, but I hope that you'll find the webinar version of our event to be equally as useful and productive. Um, the Border and Protocol Delivery Group was created to oversee cross-government preparations for the UK-EU border as a result of EU exit. Um, and we're now focused very much on preparations for the end of the transition period. And part of that includes our responsibility for engagement with member states on borders and helping businesses to prepare for the changes. Um, we're also extremely focused on preparing UK businesses for the changes um, and I think uh, those challenges are the same uh, on, on both sides. The end of the transition period, as uh, Paul mentioned, is only two months away now and as I'm sure you're all more than aware, the UK will be leaving both the customs union and the single market, whether or not a free trade agreement is reached. So this means that businesses across the UK and the EU need to prepare for new border controls, no matter what uh, happens. So free trade agreement or, or not. This is a joint responsibility through the supply chain. Um, and we'll soon be hearing from a number of experts from UK government departments to talk you through the implications implementation of these controls in, in greater detail. As you all know, the border doesn't flow in one direction only, so we're here today and at other events across the EU in the coming weeks to ensure that both UK and EU businesses are informed and working together in preparation for the 1st of January changes. And we'll be talking through some operational case studies later on, uh, which I hope will bring the information to life and help businesses prepare for the end of the transition period by using genuine um, movements to, to illustrate the difference. Uh, if we could move on to slide three, please. Um, there will be uh, customs and other requirements in place for moving goods and people from the 1st of January. There are 30 plus departments in the UK uh, involved with responsibility for border requirements and the key departments are shown here on this slide. Um, if we can move on please. A negotiated outcome does remain our goal um, but whether we reach that or not the UK leaves the customs union the single market um, and it means that there will be new processes that will have to be uh, complied with as uh, we've already said. As you can see from the uh, diagram here uh, there's an enormous amount of traffic that moves between the UK and the EU in both directions um, and much of it uh, either goes through Dover 
and Eurotunnel, uh, uh, particularly for Ireland as the land bridge. Um, but there are a number of, uh, of movements that happen directly. We're also aware that uh, new routes are opening up directly between Ireland and other member states. Um, and this may alleviate some of the concerns that people have around um, there being interruptions to the flow of traffic. If we can move to the next slide, please. Um, there will be significant challenges for all businesses that trade between the EU and, and Great Britain. Um, we recognise in particular the challenge for small and medium enterprises, um, especially given the impact of COVID-19. Um, and we're well aware that this has had uh, both a, restricted, a restricting impact, but also a financial impact. All businesses who do trade between the EU and GB need to prepare as soon as possible for the new processes and controls. Um, and we need to have that preparation on both sides. I know that you'll have questions today and things are already uh, dropping into the uh, chat column. If there are any questions that people have that they we can't answer during the event, we will do um, everything we can to turn the answers around as quickly as possible because we're very aware that the clock is ticking. In terms of infrastructure, if we can move on, please. Um, the um, we do need new infrastructure to handle uh, checks for transit movements uh, from the 1st of January and for SPS checks on goods arriving into Ireland from the G from uh, Great Britain. Um, and additionally, border control posts would be needed in the UK for handling SPS checks for goods moving from the EU. And that includes obviously goods moving from Ireland to, to GB. Uh, where GB ports have got the capacity to build on site um, and they're, they're able to apply for financial support to the Port Infrastructure Fund, um, which closed for applications uh, last Friday on the 30th. Um, and we've had an enormous response to that. Uh, where ports don't have the space to build, uh, government are making inland provisions and uh, some inland sites are already under construction. The final list will be published shortly. Um, I suspect that the one that many of you are most interested in is the site for Holyhead, um, which is uh, should be agreed very, very shortly. Infrastructure will be needed for ports to carry out checks to handle transit movements and for traffic management in some cases. Um, the map on the on the slide shows the intended inland slides inland sites, sorry, and it's it's published as part of the border operating model, which came out a few weeks ago. Um, so there will be an update on, on this very shortly. We've got a busy agenda to get through today, and there will be a lot of information to cover on trade between Ireland and GB and on movements from Ireland through GB to Europe using the UK as a land bridge. I'd like you to take the opportunity to raise your questions with the expert using the Q&A function at the end of each session as well as the final plenary session where other questions will be taken. Um, today's to help you prepare, and I hope that everyone will leave today's session with a better understanding of the preparations business need to make before the 1st of January. We're very pleased today to be joined by Caroline O'Keefe and Celine O'Neill, who are officials from Irish Revenue, and to have the support of IBEC at this event. So. We thank you all for joining our BPDG Industry Day and I now hand over to Danny McCoy, the CEO of IBEC. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. Thank you very much. And thank you and your colleagues for uh, organising this and I look forward to this morning. I'm sure it's going to be incredibly informative to also thank Ambassador Johnston for his very kind introduction. Very briefly, just to say that IBEC and, and our colleagues in the Irish Revenue really looking forward to that in, this interaction. It used to be we count down the days to Christmas, but we're counting down the days to uh, the end of the year on this occasion. Um, also, I think it's really important that um, IBEC, which has been engaged now in this Brexit debate for a very long time, actually. I, I personally made my first TV appearance in the night of David Cameron's Bloomberg speech, uh, but certainly the intensity since uh, the summer of 2016 
has been really significant. And along with our members, we've organized quite a lot of trackers, frequently asked questions, webinars, technical details. So we're really coming to the sharp end now of this trade, fundamentally in goods, because as we know, the market is uh, the single markets in which either on the UK side or in the EU side are, are more than just about goods, about people, services embodied in those people as well. So the movements, be they goods, people or animals, uh, incredibly important. The last piece I'd also say is that on, the, on this particular nodal point of the borders that the UK will have to look after, I guess the island of Ireland um, is really significant for three major trade agreements that will emerge, I'm sure, in the next couple of years. It's the relationship between the UK and the EU that we look at at the moment, but embedded in there, there's also going to be the relationship between the EU and the US, and obviously in a future UK and US agreement. And for those who are into Venn diagrams, uh, the piece in the middle on all three that will have significance uh, will be how trade and borders are managed and the island of Ireland because it has consequences potentially for those rather significant uh, geopolitical trade deals, future trade deals that are emerging. So what we do in this relationship and this tangible uh, outcome from today in terms of physical uh, look at borders and so on actually is mo even much more significant uh, than the mere interaction between our two our two islands. So I wish everybody well this morning. Looking forward to being much better informed at the end of all of this and looking forward to not just the collaboration for the next 60 days, but clearly uh, beyond that as well. So thanks everybody for organizing and uh, best wishes to our UK colleagues today as well in terms of making the presentation. So thank you on behalf of IBEC. I'll hand over uh, now to or uh, to Mark, who's going to look after us next, I think. Hi there, hope people can hear me. Thank you, uh, Danny. Um, uh, my name is Mark de Brunner, uh, and I have got a particular responsibility uh, within BPDG for the implementation of the protocol. Um, I should stress we are uh, within BPDG leaving the broader kind of negotiations and discussion at the joint and specialized committee and so on to others. Our interest is essentially practical and it's about what's going to happen uh, on the ground. Um, so I just wanted to start uh, with a reminder of the absolute uh, basics just to get our kind of collective eye in. So people will recall the Northern Ireland Protocol is that bit of the withdrawal agreement designed to avoid a hard border uh, on the island of Ireland. It does that by recognising Northern Ireland as within the UK's customs territory while at the same time applying the EU's set of customs rules, the so-called Union Customs Code uh, in Northern Ireland. Now that, as we all know, has implications for the movement of goods uh, from GB to NI uh, and to a lesser extent uh, to movement from NI to GB. Um, there are fewer implications as people will be aware from NI to GB because the protocol reflects the principle that there should be unfettered access for NI goods to the rest of the UK. So that's the kind of that's our starting point. And people also recall that there was a command paper published a little while ago that set out uh, UK government's approach to implementing the protocol. And I guess um, th three key messages worth underlining before we uh, move off that um, fr from that uh, paper. The first is that uh, for movements from Northern Ireland to the rest of the UK, essentially uh, what we're trying to do is get the position to be as close to now as possible so without uh, additional process or paperwork and as I say unfettered access for NI goods arriving in the rest of the UK. Second for uh, movements from the rest of the UK to NI we are trying to ensure that uh, the only additions uh, to process around that are as light touch as possible uh, obviously, there's a commitment to not levying tariffs on goods that remain within the UK or the UK's customs territory. Um, only those goods are ultimately entering Ireland or at clear 
and substantial risk of doing so uh, facing tariffs. Uh, there was also a commitment, people will recall in that paper, to there being no new bespoke customs infrastructure uh, either in Northern Ireland or in GB ports facing Northern Ireland. And then I guess the third key message was that uh, to recognise the need for a kind of specific uh, approach to uh, agri-foods which would build on what's already there. So expanding some existing entry points uh, in Northern Ireland for agri-foods, border control posts, uh, to provide for proportionate additional controls, uh, a system being administered in Northern Ireland by UK authorities, uh, and a, uh, a determination to make sure that checks were at a pragmatic, proportional level, recognising high standards across the UK, in line with the provision in the protocol that said that both, both parties should use best endeavours to facilitate trade and avoid controls at NI ports as far as possible. Um, there's always already been a reference to uh, the amount of time we've got left. Uh, of course, the protocol kicks in immediately after the end of the transition period on the 31st of December, and it does so whether or not there is a further agreement. Uh, so a free trade agreement beyond the withdrawal agreement that we've already struck with the EU. So quite important uh, and is certainly focusing uh, focusing minds. Um, a little while ago, uh, HMG announced a trader support service uh, as being available to any Northern Ireland businesses moving goods between GB and NI or indeed importing goods into NI from the rest of the world. Now, as well as providing help and advice that uh, TSS will handle import and safety and security declarations and my colleague from HMRC, Ellie, uh, will have a bit more to say about that in a, in a few moments time. Worth also flagging that DEFRA is considering what further support might be possible in relation to um, uh, sanitary and phytosanitary requirements for businesses wanting to move agri-foods uh, into NI from GB. For movements the other way, the principle established by the protocol of unfettered access for NI goods to the rest of the UK's market is reflected in uh, two pieces of legislation, both currently going through Parliament, so could change, but as drafted, uh, they define a qualifying good for unfettered access, a so-called qualifying NI good, as essentially a good in free circulation in Northern Ireland or which has undergone processing in NI only and incorporates goods that are in for free circulation or are so-called domestic goods. Um, that legislation prevents new checks, controls or administrative processes on qualifying NI goods moving directly between NI and GB. That expressly includes the power to disapply export declarations on goods movements between NI and GB, which has long been uh, a UK government planning assumption. Uh, there will also be anti-avoidance uh, rules not yet published, but will be in place for the end of the transition period to discourage um, circumvention uh, involving goods from the EU generally and by non-NI traders. Uh, but essentially this is intended to keep as close as possible, given that the, clearly the overall landscape is changing, but to try and keep as close as possible to the status quo for the 1st of January. The aim is to move to a longer lasting regime during the course of 2021 uh, and uh, HMG is consulting businesses, the logistics industry, the, the executive uh, and other stakeholders about what that might look like. Um, as people will be aware, there are still various other elements being firmed up, including a number of things that need to be discussed and agreed through the Joint Committee. Uh, we are committed to publishing uh, firmed up guidance as soon as uh, decisions are made. Uh, most recently, people may be aware that there was some guidance issued on VAT and uh, excise. Um, and as, as and when there is more to, to say, we'll be saying it as, as soon as. Uh, in particular, I guess it's worth noting that the question of uh, goods uh, at risk of falling into the EU's uh, internal uh, market uh, is something which is for discussion through the 
uh, the joint committee. So we'll have to see where those uh, discussions uh, get to. So there may be some uh, interest in that, but in reality, little more we can say at this stage until those discussions have uh, gone forward a bit. I'm conscious that that whole question of uh, the implementation of, of the protocol is a big subject. Clearly, we don't have time to do it fully uh, uh, to do it justice, but I hope that gives uh, some sense of the overall landscape. Um, Ellie from HMRC will add a bit more about the trader support service uh, and some other things that HMRC is doing around that. Um, and then I think uh, we have deliberately left uh, a bit of space uh, so that we can be a little bit more uh, interactive at this stage and take questions. But if I can hand over to Ellie first uh, to say a bit more about the TSS and then we will uh, open up for questions. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Mark, and uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, as Mark has introduced, my name is Ellie Patterson. I am uh, part of the Northern Ireland Stakeholder Engagement Team in HMRC. Um, I don't have, uh, I don't want to add a great deal to what Mark has already said because um, uh, we, we are very keen to move into uh, specific questions uh, the businesses and those people attending the um, the session this morning may have. Um, on the TSS, I just did want to um, say a little bit more to outline the work that HMRC in conjunction with the TSS provider are doing to, um, to get out there and spread the word more widely and uh, engage with businesses who may be impacted by the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, so you may be aware that the TSS was formally launched at the end of uh, September and is a now uh, live. There is a portal uh, that is available through either a link on gov.uk or directly, um, which businesses who are interested in uh, the TSS can register with to find out more. Um, registering with the TSS is not a commitment to using all of its service. You can register to kind of to have a look and see what's there. It's free of charge. There's no obligation to kind of use all of the services that it offers. So um, we would strongly encourage all businesses who are impacted by the protocol to access the, the portal um, uh, to, to see what's there. I mean, one of the really crucial offerings that the TSS has is they we are using it as a way to, to share a lot of training and education materials. And this will include things like slide packs and information for businesses to help them understand more detail about how the protocol works and what it means for um, what it means for goods movements. But also uh, there will be webinars and seminars that you will be able to access again to go into more detail and you will also uh, have the benefit of being able to access a call centre uh, which can be used for questions or for directing into other content and um, education and advice. So um, in that respect uh, you know, we encourage everybody to, to register and access that. Um, in addition, the other key piece that Mark did mention is that the TSS will offer a free service of um, making declarations on behalf of businesses for goods movements from Great Britain into Northern Ireland. Um, the details of precisely how that work have not been launched yet. There's still a lot of work going on behind the scenes to, to kind of to work out the kind of the mechanics of it and exactly um, how that will work. But again, registering with the TSS will enable businesses to access that content as soon as uh, as soon as it goes um, goes live um, on the service. Um, I think the only other thing I wanted to, to mention specifically on this point is um, we often get a lot of questions about the impact on the haulage industry and uh, what the port protocol means for hauliers because it does um, whilst also whilst the declaration processes uh, do impact businesses and they have to make a lot of um, changes to how uh, they do uh, record keeping to be able to make uh, the declarations for goods movements into Northern Ireland. It also has a significant impact on the haulage industry because of their role in um, both uh, entry summary declarations but also in um, linking together the processes as goods move into Northern Ireland. Um, so one of the things that we are doing in conjunction with the TSS provider is specific outreach into uh, the haulage industry, working closely with the representative bodies and trade associations that represent the haulage industry and our colleagues in the Department for Transport. Um, but 
uh, if there are people on this uh, session today who are involved with the haulage industry and um, are aware of avenues that we haven't yet started exploiting that may be uh, beneficial to uh, engage further with the haulage industry around how the TSS can specifically support them, um, please do get in touch because we are keen to uh, explore lots of different uh, avenues in this respect. The Last thing I'm going to mention is that uh, last week we also published some guidance about uh, EORI numbers in specific relation to Northern Ireland and uh, the requirements to for certain uh, uh, certain declaration processes to use an EORI number with an XI prefix rather than a GB prefix. Um, for those businesses that have a GB EORI number, if they register with the TSS, uh, we will also automatically enroll them for a, an XI prefix uh, EORI number to assist them with their interactions between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So um, just another reason to sort of to, to push the, the TSS portal out there, but also uh, for anybody who has had questions about the use of XI prefix EORIs, there is now guidance on gov.uk and we will be able to uh, share the link as part of the outputs from this session uh, today. So I won't say anything more and uh, we'll pass over for questions. Thanks for that, Ellie. Um, so very happy to take uh, questions uh, and I can see from the chat that we've got uh, a couple uh, come in already. I mean, I think uh, certainly the couple, I've, I can see three, one of which is, I guess, uh, well, actually none of which are specific to the Northern Ireland uh, protocol. There's a couple of uh, customs and tariffs questions. There's also a question about um, understanding what registrations are required in the UK for importing uh, products of animal origin from Ireland. Perhaps I should start uh, with with that one. Um, um, there is a kind of, uh, as people will know, a staged approach to uh, controls uh, which from a UK perspective are on imports uh, from outside the, the UK. Those stage controls apply uh, gradually from the 1st of January with the effect that um, there is essentially uh, little change certainly for products of animal origin from the 1st of January. I guess the main change comes from uh, April where there will be a new uh, paperwork requirement both for POAO and some plants because th uh, those uh, those products uh, will require um, pre-notification and uh, health documentation so uh, export health certificates will need to be uh, accompanying those movements from April uh, and then from uh, July as the UK kind of fully turns up the dial on its uh, import controls um, then as far as um, SPS checks are concerned there will be an increase in the physical the number of physical checks uh, that are done and those checks will be done at um, border control post rather than as they will have been done uh, before that um, at the destination. So those are the kind of two main changes that are happening in relation to uh, the import into the UK of products of um, animal origin. Um, Ellie, did you want to pick up the questions about um, uh, customs and tariffs or do you want me to pick those up? Uh, Mark, can I suggest the ones about just that generally about customs and tariff? We perhaps um, there, David Vallely from HMRC has the section after us and will be dealing with um, uh, general questions about uh, customs processes after the end of the transition period. So I wonder if we pick them up as part of David's session um, rather than uh, this Fine. one. That, that's true. It, I mean, it is it is fair that they are broad, more broad than the Northern Ireland. Actually, those questions apply equally to, uh, to to movements between GB and EU generally. So very happy to do that. Um, if there are any other kind of questions that are more specific to the protocol, very happy to to pick those up. So, Mark, there is one about uh, have there been discussions or plans on how courier companies will work for Northern Ireland as they are excluded from the uh, from the TSS? Uh, so um, just to address this, HMRC is working closely with the uh, the express operator and uh, fast parcel operators um, around the requirements for any declaration processes into Northern Ireland. So I don't have anything more we can say on that at the moment because that is still um, that's still a, a live discussion and um, 
is still being worked through, but we will be able to say uh, at the point of time when we can say more about this, uh, we will uh, we will obviously come out with that. But just to reassure that HMRC is in close discussion with uh, those businesses on um, on the options for them. Thanks for that, Ellie. And I can you now you've drawn my attention to uh, once I scroll down, there were a couple of other questions. There was one about um, moving pharmaceuticals uh, from the UK to both Southern and Northern Ireland. Uh, that actually falls into the kind of same category of uh, uh, good and movement as um, Ellie described. So uh, we understand uh, there are there are discussions ongoing about precisely how the movement of uh, pharmaceuticals will occur. People will be aware that there is a uh, an EU-wide uh, tracing system uh, in operation at the moment, and we are uh, in discussion uh, over how that, in practice, uh, uh, will be uh, operating uh, operating from the uh, from the first of January. So that is a live point discussion and uh, as soon as we've got um, some stability there we will be um, issuing guidance but we're not quite at that point yet. Um, the other perhaps I pick up in the absence of uh, further through the chat let me pick up one other point that I had been kind of pre-asked about uh, which was uh, in relation to kind of whether there are specific considerations in relation to sort of all island industries uh, and free trade agreements uh, that the EU uh, has with other uh, countries. Um, so, um, of course, under the protocol, goods produced in Northern Ireland can circulate freely throughout the EU. Um, I think it's fair to say uh, those goods uh, are not EU goods for the purposes of uh, existing EU FTAs because NI is still legally part of the UK's customs territory, but of course international trade will benefit NI exporters because their goods get whatever preferential access that the UK negotiates with uh, around the world partners. Uh, and of course NI importers get access to a wider choice. So where the UK has FTAs with third countries, NI businesses will get those preferential tariffs just as for the rest of the UK and any new lower UK tariffs will be charged on goods entering NI just as in the rest of the UK where those goods remain in the UK's customs territory. Uh, so I think that's the, the fullest description I can uh, offer at, at this stage. Uh, let me just see if I can uh, pick out, oh I can see there's a there's a whole host of questions and I know we won't yeah. have time to answer all of those in um, Mark, Sorry, can I just interject in? with, yeah, I just wanted to come in with one that's specifically about the TSS, which is asking, can EU companies register on the, the TSS? So to be able to register for the TSS portal and access the materials that are on there, there is no, uh, there's no requirement to be established in a certain part of uh, either the UK or the EU. Um, the, the service um, can be accessed by uh, non-UK businesses as well as uh, UK businesses. Thank you for that, Ellie. Uh, let me let me pick out uh, two others that I can see particularly. So there's a question. How does recent legislation passed by the UK Parliament impact on the NI protocol? Uh, well, of course, the legislation hasn't quite been passed yet. Uh, we've got a statutory instrument which is in process and there are um, uh, clauses of the UK Internal Market Bill which are which are going through Parliament um, at the moment. What I tried to describe was the effect of the legislation assuming it uh, it ends up as it as it now as it now looks. Uh, so I have covered that but uh, it is fair to say that uh, until the legislation is finally through uh, all its uh, kind of uh, stages in Parliament we can't be absolutely sure about that but what I've tried to uh, what I've tried to describe is the situation uh, on the basis of that legislation it essentially survives uh, in, in its essentials in the way in which it was introduced uh, into into Parliament. But we'll be able to take a, a final view about that in a, in a few weeks time, I guess. Uh, and then there was a question about whether consignments from GB to NI require safety and security declarations and uh, EHCs uh, if, if if of products of animal origin and the answer is um, yes to both uh, safety and security decks and EHCs will be needed um, as Ellie has said um, the trader support uh, service uh, 
exists will be up and running uh, precisely to help uh, traders uh, make uh, safety and security as well as uh, import uh, declarations. Uh, and I did mention that DEFRA is uh, already doing some work to understand uh, what uh, what support it would be possible to give, uh, it, particularly in relation to movements of uh, agri-food consignments. Um, more on that as soon as it becomes uh, uh, more stable and, and clear, but that is definitely a point of uh, ongoing consideration. I'm conscious we are at or pretty much at at time. Um, Danny, if there was anything else that you wanted us to, to address before we uh, moved on, uh, please flag. Mark, sorry, it's Margaret. Good, uh, good morning. All. Um, uh, Patricia uh, was going to uh, facilitate these questions, but uh, you and Ali are so enthusiastic about the subject. I think um, you've managed to cover them up and we're picking them up as you go. Thank you. But I'd just like to invite Patricia quickly, if there's anything else that she's picked up um, Prior to the event, I know that IBEC had asked for questions to come in before or anything that uh, you'd like to see covered before Mark and Ellie go off to do other things. Thanks very much, Mar uh, Margaret, and thank you very much uh, to both uh, Mark and Ellie. And uh, just to say that we did have a presentation on the TSS for our Northern Ireland members who are drinks manufacturers during the week, and it was really excellent. So I think it's great that that service is now available. Um, I think in terms of the questions that have been posted here this morning are similar to the ones that, that we had gotten in advance. And again, people are very anxious, I think, to get more clarity in terms of that practical detail questions that we had received were things like uh, when Irish businesses are moving goods to GB very, via NI, for example, from Donegal, what issues would they be facing? Will export declarations from NI to GB be required? Um, and then queries about port infrastructure. So again, people are worried and, and would like some reassurance in terms that the ports will be up to whatever capacity might be needed. Um, and then back to the logistics and haulier companies, which again have posted many of their own questions here this morning. So um, if you had anything further on, on, on those issues, that would be great. Uh, let me pick up a couple of those. So I mean, specifically on the question of um, export declarations from NIGB, um, and it's long been the UK government's position that export declarations wouldn't be uh, required for movements NI uh, to GB and the draft UKIM uh, legislation that I talked about. Um, part of the point of that is to uh, put that kind of beyond uh, doubt in domestic legislation because it would specifically give ministers the power to say um, actually uh, export de declarations would would not apply but that has kind of long been our planning assumption and I think the point of the UKIM uh, legislation there would be purely to act as a kind of confirming safety net for a position that uh, UK government has long taken. Um, on, on infrastructure, the position remains that um, there is uh, a very clear view from UK government that there is no need for uh, new bespoke customs infrastructure either in NI or in uh, GB ports that face uh, NI. The only uh, uh, increase uh, addition to infrastructure is uh, in relation to um, SPS goods and the need to do uh, uh, sanitary and phytosanitary checks under the official control regulations. Uh, we've we've taken a view that we uh, want to keep those to an absolute minimum consistent with our uh, protocol uh, obligations, but we accept that there will need to be some additional infrastructure and indeed uh, plans are in place. Uh, delivery is in process around that uh, infrastructure, but it is kind of limited and it builds on um, existing points of uh, points of entry. So I hope that that is reassuring and addresses the question as far as we can. Great, thank you. Well, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Ellie, and thank you, Patricia. Um, we will, uh, I, I don't think Mark and Ellie are staying with us for the rest of the event, but uh, we will collect questions, um, answer those we can, and save them for Mark and Ellie and get answers back to you as soon as possible. <laughs> Look forward to that, Margaret. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thanks all. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Margaret Whitby. I also work at the Border and Protocol Delivery Group. Um, I'm part of the EU member state engagement team and we have the uh, absolute pleasure of um, talking to stakeholders and officials across the EU about the practical border measures. Um, since the publication of the border operating model 
in uh, early July and then its recent update at the beginning of October. We've done a number of events across the EU, including in Ireland, um, just to spell out the, the practical steps that people will have to take to move their goods in particular across the border. Um, and if I could have the next slide, please. Um, we have done a number of polls at these events. As you can, uh, if we could just go back a slide, please, sorry. Um, so we've done a number of polls at these events and we have tested readiness with uh, those who have taken part in our events. Now, I should um, say that statisticians would probably not be terribly pleased with the, the sort of uh, numbers that are filling these in, but it does, there are consistencies here. And what we are seeing is that there are many businesses across the EU that are not aware of the actions required. Some are aware, but they haven't started to take those actions, as you can see in the amber. Um, in the green section, some businesses have started to take action and there's a small percentage, um, 10 to 15 percent of varying, varying between events that are ready for day one. That is the 1st of January. Um, we're keeping an eye on this. As I said, the numbers that are com completing the um, things can often be small. Um, but it does give us a good sense of where businesses are. I gather there are much wider polls that IBEC and others indeed I'm sure are involved in um, in the member states, um, but we are hearing the message in the UK and across the EU that we need to help people to understand what actions they have to take. All of this builds up to the fact that we would like you to do a poll for us as well, please. Thank you very much. Um, and on the next slide, it tells you that you can log in to do that poll on Slido using hashtag BPDG. If you've got a, a spare gadget open and you can uh, log into www.slido, um, the hashtag BPDG will ask you the first question, which is on the next slide. A very straightforward question. And I wouldn't like to preempt the outcome of this, but I suspect um, I suspect we have an audience here today that is fully aware that the um, end of the transition period will have an impact on the way you trade with the UK. But if you could just confirm that for us, we'd be very pleased. Thank you as the yes or no. When you've done that, then we have a second question before we get started on some more presentations in detail for you. And this question is a little bit more uh, complex, but it really is along the lines of the, the first slide that I showed you. So it's where you are on the journey for preparation. Um, do you understand the actions you have to take and have you started to take those actions? So which of those statements best applies to you or your business? One to four, please. And we, if you could fill in that poll for us, we'd be very grateful. It will run throughout the next few sessions and then we will um, come back to you towards the end with a readout of where we are. The first slide I showed you had um, results of polls. We haven't named the countries. As I said, there are some variations across country and indeed across events in the same country. So it seems a little unfair to start naming uh, particular member states. But as I said, there are some patterns across all of them. And we hope what we uh, cover today with you helps you to be more towards the four end of things than the one. While you're thinking about that, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. As I mentioned, the uh, border operating model was published in July. It was updated at the beginning of October. It's a lengthy document, but it's got a lot of detail. Um, it includes all of the detail that you're going to need to move goods across the borders. It's got a number of flow charts in there um, of the different types of goods and the different position of uh, the different requirements. There are also some other uh, wonderful publications on gov.uk. There's a very straightforward import and export guide available. And um, we will be sharing these slides with you and we will share the fuller links to these uh, publications at the end of the, the slideshow. But the UK board operating model is well worth a look um, and it's got uh, everything you ever needed to know about it. Uh, we don't expect to do a full update of that in the weeks or months to come, but as and when detail changes, I think as Stella touched on, we will update that as necessary, but there won't be a, a whole republication of it again until perhaps next summer. Thank you. If we can move on to the next slide. Before uh, I come on to uh, hand you over to the different government departments that we've got with us today to cover the detail about customs and uh, movement of control goods, etc. I just wanted to start with some basics. Um, 
many of you will know this, but it's always worth remembering because the question comes up again and again at events about EORI numbers. Um, you, businesses will need an EORI number if they're interacting with systems and so on in a uh, in the UK or in uh, an EU member state. So importers and exporters in GB must have an EORI number issued by the UK to interact with those systems. EU importers or export must, of course, have an EORI number issued by an EU member state to interact with those systems. Um, if you, um, as an Irish business, happen to have a GB EORI number now, it will not be applicable in Ireland and vice versa. So you'll need to tidy up those EORI numbers and make sure that you've got uh, the EORI numbers you need for the interacting with those systems. Hauliers will need EORI numbers to interact with systems as well if they're doing um, transit movements, for instance, interacting with NCTS systems, and indeed we'll come on to talk to you about the other row row systems that will be in place, such as GVMS, and EORI numbers will be required um, in the UK for those as well. Um, also worth mentioning the uh, other step required is, of course, to establish and agree your INCO terms and conditions with your exporter or importer in uh, the UK. That ensures that the responsibility for any duties or clearance is um, is clear from the outset that if a truck is held at a particular border, you're all clear about who's responsible for sorting out any issues. And we've included the link here to the International Chamber of Commerce standing standard trading terms and conditions, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. Moving on to the next slide. We um, have a slide next that talks about how to get uh, a Niori number. Um, but uh, so if you're uh, sorry, uh, you, you'll need, as I said, you'll need a Niori number to lodge customs declarations in a particular customs territory. So you'll need a UK Niori number to lodge a customs uh, declaration in the UK and uh, an, an EU one to lodge one in one of the member states, including Ireland. If you're submitting entry summary declarations or exit summary declarations, again, you'll need a Niori number in that customs territory. The next slide um, talks you through, I think, uh, how to apply for an EORI number. You can uh, apply for and get a UK EORI number on gov.uk. Um, it will start with GB and it doesn't take long to apply, five, ten minutes on gov.uk. We did sit down at events last year and do this with a number of EU traders and it did work. So well worth doing if you haven't done it already and you think you're going to need one. Um, the EU EORI numbers, um, as you many of you be familiar with them, I'm sure you have links to the Irish website, but just in case there's the National Customs website there that Europa publish and that will take you off to the, the uh, websites for the different member states. On to the next slide, please. One of the other questions we get asked a lot at uh, events is about being established in the UK. When do you need to be established in the UK to meet a number of customs rules? Um, and it's just where it's a quite a complex area. There's a lot of detail on gov.uk um, and it can vary uh, for individuals and corporations. So what we've listed here is the sort of evidence that you might need to provide to show that you are established in the UK because you would need to be established to uh, access customs authorizations and simplifications such as um, special procedures, um, customs freight simplified procedures and of course uh, some of the uh, other simplified procedures such as um, temporary storage and so on. So if you need to be established in the UK to do what you need to do, this is the sort of evidence that you might be asked for. Do you have a certificate of registration? Do you have details for staff or employed? Is there a physical premises owned or leased by the business? As um, some of my friends in HMRC won't mind my saying, I hope that they, they tend to like to have a door they can knock on if they need to. That's uh, but there's a lot of detail, as I said, on gov.uk. And of course, the next slide then just outlines and sends you towards a website that talks about being established in the EU. If we could move there, thank you. Um, you must be established in the EU uh, for certain operations, of course, and you should to be established in the EU, you must have an EU VAT number. Um, and I think we provided a link. If not, we'll add that to this slide before we send them out. Thank you.
Right, at the risk of spoiling the story a little bit, and many of you will be familiar with this, but I know my colleagues in HMRC um, and from the Department of Environment and Rural Affairs will be coming on to talk about the staged approach that the UK has put in place for the end of the transition period. Um, this staged approach was put in place to reflect the fact that businesses have been uh, busy and dealing with COVID-19 and that uh, they that would uh, impact on their ability to prepare. So for goods being imported to Great Britain um, from the 1st of January, the declaration and control um, declarations are required for controlled goods, for excise goods. But if you're bringing importing standard goods to Great Britain, you can access a, um, a simplified procedure that allows you to make an entry in your own records uh, when the goods are imported. And then you have six months until you have to submit a full declaration and or pay any tariffs, so six months from the date of import. There will be um, no safety and security declarations for any imports to Great Britain for the first six months. So from the 1st of January to the 30th of June, um, those importing goods to Great Britain will not need to submit safety and security declarations. Um, any physical checks that will be required for high risk foods will be um, at the destination. And our, our uh, colleagues from DEFRA will come on to talk a little bit about that registration process. And it's fairly light touch if you need to get your goods checked at the destination. In April, things change a little bit and we'll talk you through some of this in the case study later. But there will be some pre-registration required for certain products. Uh, if they're arriving in Great Britain from the 1st of April and then from the 1st of July, full controls come into place. So you have to submit safety and security declarations for all GB imports and customs declarations will have to be uh, submitted at import. Of course, if businesses already have access to simplified procedures, if they're authorised to use those, they can continue to do that. That applies from July. And any controls required on um, particular goods will take place at the border control posts. Um, that's uh, just a, a, a taster, perhaps, of what my colleagues are going to talk you through in more detail now. Um, and coming up, we're going to have uh, a presentation from David Vallali of um, HM Revenue and Customs. And after that, we will have a Q&A session facilitated by Pat Ivory, who is the director of the EU and International Affairs at IBEC. But um, if I can hand over to David, first of all, and then we'll be able to take your questions from HMRC. Thank you very much. Hi, thanks, Margaret. Um, just to confirm, can you hear me OK? <laughs> Yes, David. Yes, David. Can you hear and clear? <laughs> Good stuff. Always worth double checking uh, with, with the, the new ways of working we have <laughs> that it is indeed all working uh, as we expect. Um, so, yeah, as uh, as both uh, Margaret and Ellie uh, previously alluded to, I'm David Vallely. I work in the uh, also in the external stakeholder team at HMRC. Um, what I'm going to cover now is, is some of what's been referenced in a few of the questions is much more the uh, east west movements um, to, to what was covered in the in Mark and Ellie's bit of the north south um, and the staging in that, as, as Margaret said, uh, she spoiled the story off slightly, um, but I'll give a little bit more detail on that. So if we move on to the next slide. So. Um, as we've mentioned already, we'll be introducing our, our customs controls at the end of the transition period at the end, end of this year in, in stages. Um, and that's starting with uh, some of the controls from the 1st of January and then moving to full customs controls for all goods uh, as of the 1st of July. And I'll go through what that means for each stage, both for import and export uh, in the coming slides. Um, but on this one, we just wanted to highlight a few key things that if you take nothing away, you take away um, these, these key points. Firstly, uh, the requirement for safety and security declarations on imports, so into uh, the UK or ENS as they're known, uh, that will be waived for six months. Um, traders importing controlled goods such as excise goods, and there is a, a list available uh, in the latest uh, operating model and, and on gov.uk of what that th those controlled goods are, um, these will need to have full customs requirements from the 1st of January 2021. Um, and something many of you have asked us about um, both in, in the run up to the end of the transition period, but also previously no deal scenarios uh, is around the Common Transit Convention um, and the UK will be joining uh, the Common Transit Convention in its own right as of the 1st of 
January 2021. And um, due to this being much more of an international agreement, we haven't been able to do this in stages. Um, so the full requirements uh, will be there and applicable from the 1st of January. So if we move on to the first, uh, the next slide, please. Um, so firstly, I'm going to look at import declarations from the 1st of January 2021 to the 1st of July 2021. So that that first six months of of uh, next year. Um, so at that point, customs declarations will be needed, um, and and they'll need to be pre-lodged in advance of that crossing uh, if they're moving through a, a listed roll-on roll-off port uh, or a location without any uh, existing systems or uh, or using transit. Um, but what we have done to to facilitate uh, this and this readiness is that traders moving non-controlled goods can make that declaration um, by uh, making an entry in their own records um, rather than an actual uh, declaration to, uh, to HMRC um, itself. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's, it maybe wouldn't known to you, uh, some of you already uh, as EIDR or entrance in declarants records um, and there is information on exactly what that looks like, what those pieces of information we'd need to see recorded are in the border operating model uh, conveniently noted here at 1.13 and um, but these broadly uh, uh, piece of information you're likely to be holding anyway such as dates and um, type of good amounts and, and costs um, but there is a full list of, of what we'd be looking for uh, in that operating model um, you'll then need to, to keep these records um, and then submit uh, a supplementary declaration uh, within six months of that initial import uh, and then pay any of the required duty uh, via the, the approved duty deferment account. It's worth saying at that point that, that this isn't a, a six month cliff edge, it's a, it's a rolling six months, so something um, brought in uh, on the 1st of January, you'd have six months from 1st of January to 1st of July, same with with March, six months from March, April, six months from April, um, so that it's not one single kind of cliff edge where we'd expect six months worth of declarations in one go. Um, and, and traders moving controlled goods, again, such as those excise goods, uh, would need to make that full declaration, as I mentioned before, um, but this can be, be a full declaration or it can be simplified or uh, a transit declaration, depending on those, uh, the authorizations that trader holds and um, to be able to potentially make that simplified declaration or um, use use transit from the 1st of January. Um, so if we move to the next slide. Um, here's uh, just a slide with, with some of those bits of EIDR we, we mentioned. So um, such as customs procedure codes, the value, uh, any, any relevant uh, reference numbers, um, date and time. Um, so quite some of these should be fairly standard that you're, you're recording anyway. Um, so if we move to the next slide. So covering off export declarations, uh, and again, this is from the 1st of January 2021, um, traders exporting goods from GB into the EU will need to submit uh, export declarations for all goods. So there isn't a differentiation on exports of um, either controlled or non-controlled. Um, and traders will again be required uh, to submit safety and security information on, on those exports. Uh, and this is either again by a, a combined export declaration or uh, a standalone uh, EXS exit summary declaration. Um, for excise goods on, on uh, uh, exports, a bit more um, a bit more interest on that kind of side of things. So um, for these excise goods moving under under duty suspense only, if those goods are moving through a, a location that does not have a system to, to automatically communicate to HMRC, um, that, that those goods have have left um, left the country, the traders must provide proof to, to us here at HMRC um, after the goods ha have indeed left the country to, to prove that they have, have indeed left. Um, so that's export declarations and that's uh, from the 1st of January onwards as there's no uh, staging in uh, as it stands for, for exports. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Um, so now what I'll run through with you is uh, probably the more complicated elements of it, which is the full controls from the 1st of July 2021 uh, and how we'll be um, implementing that. So as it says here, we'll need uh, full customs declarations or again any simplified procedures that you may wish to look at uh, becoming authorised to, to use um, as of uh, the 1st of July. Um, and it, that's for all goods that will then require that customs declaration and that six months waiver on um, import safety and security uh, will have lapsed. So safety and security declarations will be required on those uh, on those imports. So go to the next slide, please. So 
how we are going to, to implement this control is via two um, two models. So, and it's up to the locations, the specific board locations, to choose which uh, model they they wish to use. First, being temporary storage model, uh, which will be familiar to those uh, trading with the rest of the world, uh, or there's a newly developed uh, pre lodgement model, which I'll go into more detail in the next couple of slides. Uh, and this has been developed as as a as an alternative to to that pre lodgement temporary storage. Uh, sorry, the temporary storage model. Um, because not all board locations have the necessary space or infrastructure to, to put in place a full temporary storage uh, regime. So um, I'll quickly run through what a temporary storage model looks like. Um, so what this does is it allows goods to be stored for up to 90 days at a HMRC approved uh, temporary storage facility um, before a declaration is needed uh, and then a government uh, as government officials we can carry out any any necessary checks um, before those goods are, are released out of that temporary storage facility. Um, pre-lodgement model, the new one, uh, what this does is it ensures that all those declarations uh, coming through those ports are pre-lodged uh, before they board on the EU side uh, and this will help uh, maintain flow at those high high volume roll on roll off locations um, that that may experience uh, a bit of a backlog um, but don't have the the, the space to, to implement that uh, temporary storage model and um, it's worth saying that um, we don't currently have a, a full list of which ports are using which as it's a commercial decision for those ports but it's something we're working through uh, with them with detailed engagement to make sure that they they are ready to to operate one of these models and um, so if we move on to the next slide please so many of you may have heard of, of gvms already uh, the goods vehicle movement service um, but i'll run through it in a little bit more detail now uh, so you, you understand the principles behind it um, and this is uh, uh, an IT system being developed to facilitate that pre-lodgement model um, and it will be uh, should be read up and running by July 2021 and it's it's all on track uh, the latest I heard so what it does is it enables declaration references um, whether it be SNS um, transit or, or just a standard customs declaration to be linked together so that that person uh, moving the goods most likely the driver of the lorry only has to present a single um, a single reference uh, at the frontier to prove uh, that those all those goods have the necessary declarations uh, and that single uh, reference is called a GMR or a goods movement reference number and um, so as I say this this allows the, the linking together of uh, of the movements of all those goods um, in that that specific trailer um, and, and then it can also uh, enable the automatic arrival into our, our systems here at HMRC as soon as those goods board so they can be processed during the crossing um, and and either uh, and then we can notify the, the person in control whether the, the goods are cleared or uncleared um, and and communicate to them if they need to go to any checks. What it will also do um, as of the 1st of January, so by July it will be up and running for all those pre-lodgement ports. Um, but from 1st of January, it will be able to uh, automate the Office of Transit function, uh, which is able to mark the, that point of entry of the goods into the, the GB Customs territory. Um, so it'll be, be able to do that as part of its, its functionality. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, this just provides a very brief kind of visual representation of, of what it does, uh, and this is for imports. So you can see there we have multiple unique reference numbers all being um, amalgamated together and populating a single GMR within GVMS. Um, then that uh, data can, can allow us at government to, to carry out uh, necessary risking uh, and um, communicate to notify that those goods again are, are either cleared or, or not uh, on their arrival. So if we move on to the next slide. Uh, this shows exactly the same for export because GVMS will, will also be used for export. And as there you can see, same kind of declarations, just export versions and uh, uh, ourselves here at HMRC being, being notified those goods have left. Um, so that, that kind of covers off GVMS. Uh, if we move to the next slide, please. Um, for the sake of completeness, uh, HMRC covers a, a range of things, though I am no uh, expert in excise and VAT, um, but felt it's, it's always worth um, 
covering off the position on those as, as we do often receive a number of questions on it. Um, so for exercise from the 1st of January 2021, rest of world rules will apply um, and that's for imports and exports uh, of goods moving between GB and the EU. Uh, and businesses will need to complete uh, customs and import declarations behind all that using the, the necessary codes uh, for any duty paid or, or those that are suspended. Um, if businesses are, are then moving those duty suspended excise goods to and from tax warehouses um, to the port where they're, they're either entering or exiting GB, um, they'll still need to continue to use the or, or they will need to use the UK version of, of EMCS, the, the excise movement and control system, uh, and that'll also be needed to you be used between uh, the movement of goods between any UK warehouses as well. Um, on VAT, uh, we announced that at the budget that um, from the 1st of January 2021, postponed VAT accounting um, will be available to, to VAT registered businesses uh, for imports of goods from all countries, um, both rest of world and, and EU. Um, however, you're not going to be compelled to, to use um, postponed accounting uh, unless um, you're importing non-controlled goods and are delaying that uh, supp supplementary customs declaration or again use the, the simplified customs declaration process uh, as it stands today um, and make that uh, EIDR, that entrance in declarance records. Um, so I think that's all the slides from me. Um, happy to, to take a bit of Q&A now from um, Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot about the, <laughs> the empty, empty truck section of it. Um, so yeah, it, it's HMRC's intention to create uh, the necessary legislation to minimise uh, any requirements for declarations um, on reusable packaging uh, post transition, um, but this is, is subject to parliamentary procedures and legislative uh, timetables um, that, that will keep uh, everybody, all the our stakeholders updated on. Um, so for imports, EU to GB, uh, Legislation will follow for, for reusable packaging to be uh, declared by conduct or orally, um, removing the need for any of those separate customs declarations for the for the packaging. Um, without the le legislation, the packaging would usually need to be declared under under temporary admission, um, and there will be a, an import safety and security declaration requirement where the packaging is imported empty once uh, once the staged customs uh, period allowing a waiver of the safety and security declaration ends. Um, I think that is it now, um, unless I have forgotten another slide. <laughs> um, so happy to take questions now. Um, I believe it's a colleague, uh, our, our friends at um, IBEC that are facilitating this. Uh, Thanks very much, David. This is uh, Pat Ivory here from IBEC and a uh, very interesting presentation and, and lots of, of good detail in it there for uh, everybody who's on, on the call. Um, just a, a couple of, of uh, clarifications. I mean, the, uh, the UK border operating model, um, which you revised on the 8th of October, um, and gave some further detail on the phased uh, plan for, for exports and imports, and, the, and you addressed that early in your, in your presentation. So essentially, uh, I mean, are we correct in saying this is a suspension rather than a waiver of customs requirements in, in the majority of cases? And um, that, that will have some benefit for business, uh, but they will have to make those declarations in time, apart from say the safety and security, uh, declarations which are actually a waiver, but on the exports and import sides, there is a need to um, to make those declarations in time. Is yeah, correct. Yep. So um, how it's an interesting way, as I say, of thinking of it, of whether it's a, a suspension or a, a waiver. It's it's just a different way of making a declaration. So EIDR does exist uh, already today uh, for those that have CFSP or Customs Freight Simplified Procedures. So it is a a, a well used and known process, and and we. We're just kind of replicating that on a broader scale um, and to make that supplementary declaration um, for that import after that six months, it, it, it basically buys people, uh, especially due to, to the impacts of COVID-19 the last uh, the last nine months or so, um, you know, it's it'd been a real challenge to, to get everything in place. So to make that supplementary declaration, you, you would either need to become CFSP authorised or find a um, a customs agent or intermediary to to make that declaration um, on your behalf using that authorization. So it's rather than spending declarations or, or anything, it, it's just using uh, a pre-existing um, 
process, but at a much wider scale that is how I, I think of it myself. <laughs> OK, th thanks, David. And, and just in terms of your IT systems and the electronic documentation, and you, you, um, you spoke in your presentation about a pre-lodgement model, uh, which is a, a, a new initiative, a newly developed initiative, as, as opposed to the temp temporary storage model. And, and this, I think, uh, mirrors the, the pre-boarding uh, notification uh, model that's been developed by the EU and the Irish uh, uh, customs authorities. And, and just in terms of that, um, will your IT systems be completely up and running on the, on the 1st of January? And, and how do you interact? How are you going to interact with your EU and Irish colleagues in, in terms of those uh, particular IT models? Yep, um, the latest I heard from from our delivery teams that are preparing all this is it's it's on track, especially to deliver that that transit function as of January. The full function uh, wouldn't hope then be needed till till later next year. So again, uh, we have a little bit of time there. Um, but there there is um, technical specifications online for for the software developers, and there is um, I believe I'm not fully tech speak, but there are. Um, test environments um, that are being used to to make sure that it's all up and running for for those that need it um, again with the the interactions with the other it systems um, i can't comment on that as it's it's not specifically my my area but uh, as far as i know everything is on track to to be delivered for the end of the year okay, and, then, and then july after that of course <laughs> And, and the preparedness of your border control post, we might uh, uh, talk about that a little bit. And, and how do you plan to e e work with also the EU authorities in terms of ensuring the integrity of both your market in the UK and the integrity of the single market and that there isn't um, a rise in, in um, uh, illegal trade or fraud um, in terms of moving across, across borders? And then just maybe a little supplementary on that in, in terms of the, the pre-boarding notification and your pre-lodgement model and the driver having this uh, uh, goods vehicle movement uh, service uh, number uh, that, that, that will be dead as GMR, uh, good movement reference number. Will, this, will there be a, a, um, a lane system in, in British ports where if, you, if you've passed all your, your documentation, you go to a green lane, if if you have some some uh, delays, you're in you're on you're on amber, and then if you have to get checked, you're pulled over for for red. Will that will that system operate on the on the UK side? Um, yep, that's something that the 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 maybe not necessarily lanes, but uh, notifications to to the the driver. Um, that's what GVMS will do. It will communicate that of of what um, whether cleared or uncleared, and what actions they need to take there thereafter. Um, on the border posts and preparations, um, colleagues at BPDG may have more to say, um, but there is um, planning afoot and, and the necessarily work being done by colleagues at, at Border Force as well um, to make sure that the, the compliance behind um, this, these new uh, systems are in place. Um, and, and we have been, I know, I think Margaret and, and others on the call have been engaging with our, our colleagues um, fairly extensively uh, across uh, the EU on that. Um, I'm not sure if Margaret or anybody else wants to come in to, to provide any further info on that or if uh, equally, if you're happy with my answer. <laughs> Maybe um, if Margaret wants to come back in, in, in a while, but maybe just to, I'm just conscious of, of time. Um, a number of questions that have come up in, in the chat is, uh, obviously this is a very complex uh, business for a lot of companies who have not been involved in, in customs declarations and, and procedures uh, before. And um, they are asking in terms of, uh, are there customs agents available in the UK to, to do this work um, for companies and particularly SMEs who may not have the in-house uh, capability to do this themselves? Um, also, uh, from uh, questions from logistics companies, can the logistics companies continue to do this for their, for their clients? Uh, can clients rely on their logistics companies to to be that part of the supply chain, which actually uh, does all this for for them? Um, and what's the what's the, the what do you think is going to be the strain in terms of 
moving from a free flowing system to companies actually having to make the declarations. But well, this is a, an area I, I specifically work on around uh, intermediary capacity. So when we refer to an intermediary, we, we mean uh, someone that makes a declaration on behalf of someone else. Uh, and it is an area of uh, particular interest uh, at the moment across across government. Um, and what we recently announced was uh, 50 million pounds worth of funding on top of a previous uh, 34 million pounds worth of funding to increase the capacity of that declaration making sector. Um, but this most recent 50 million pounds went further in that anybody intending uh, to make customs declarations can apply for it. So not just a freight forward or a customs intermediary, but any business that is is looking to to make declarations. So as I said, um, you, you might, some businesses may decide that they'll make the declarations themselves if they, they have the capacity or it, it all depends on a, a range of different factors. Um, the amounts they're moving, how regularly they move it, the value and the complexity. Um, but there is a big piece of work going on there um, to really drive up the, the intermediary sector and we have seen it uh, a reaction to that. Um, but it is a, as a, a commercial decision for, for the businesses to decide whether um, they they wish to make their own declarations or, or um, get an intermediary and it might be a, again a, an opportunity as you say for the, the hauliers uh, to to offer another service perhaps, um, but in that kind of strain that that uh, on your question of where do you see the strain where I think it is, it's it's around the importance of everybody in the supply chain talking to each other and making sure they clearly set out with each other whose roles and responsibilities uh, where they sit, who is going to make the declaration, whether it's the trader or the haulier or a freight forwarder um, and make sure ahead of um, both the 1st of January and, and July that those agreements uh, and that that conversation, those conversations have taken place uh, and the the routes to communicate between that supply chain um, are are established and in place. So um, that that transfer of uh, of information is going to be key, not only into ourselves in government, but within the supply chain itself. OK, thanks, David. And maybe a final question in, in, in this particular uh, section. And there, there's a, a, I see a good future questions in the, in the chat function around SPS and movement of animals. So I'll leave that till the, till the next section, which is on, on food. Uh, but just in terms of, of um, uh, in, an, in a no deal scenario, I mean, in terms of tariffs and, and when would you expect your tariff uh, schedules and how would that that actually apply and then maybe also a question in terms of if you're moving goods um, from Northern Ireland to Ireland and to the UK would there be um, export uh, and import uh, declarations for those goods as opposed to goods that move from Ireland into the Northern Ireland and into the UK to an to a Northern Ireland port into the UK into Great Britain, say for example, for example, if you follow what I mean there. Yep. Um, so uh, on the first question around the tariffs, um, that is more uh, a case of uh, for for colleagues at the Department of International Trade who who lead on the the negotiations the the relevant tariff um, regimes. But worth saying on what I've covered today. Um, the, the declarations will be needed no matter the outcome of of the negotiations and yeah, um, you know we'll will be outside and that that is a key bit that I think is sometimes misunderstood by by a number of people that will be outside the single market and outside the customs union therefore declarations will be needed and um, so it's worth clarifying that as, a, as something separate to, to what those tariffs will be um, on the difference between NIGB and ROIGB um, Ireland uh, as I understand it will be treated as any part of the EU and therefore goods moving um, not wanting to comment too much on the the Northern Ireland Republic of Ireland movement itself as that's um, that's kind of my colleagues Ellie and, and Mark who covered that uh, earlier uh, who have as you can imagine rather complex so I don't want to uh, stray into to too much complexity there um, but those movements as if they were from Republic of Ireland to uh, to GB would be as if they were anywhere else from Europe into GB. So I know that I think that partly answers your question, um, but then uh, kind of as I say needing to refer back to what my colleagues covered earlier about that Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland land border um, element, which as I say is it's complicated to say the least. Okay, uh, thanks, David, and, and and just in the interest of of uh, keeping the program running. Uh, quite late so maybe uh, just to finish up the, the session there and say thanks to David for, for a really 
interesting and, and very informative uh, conversation. And we look forward to keeping up the dialogue with you in the weeks and months ahead. Thanks very much, David. No problem. Thank you both um, for David and Pat, for David for a great presentation and Pat for making it a lively conversation afterwards. Thank you. Um, uh, David, there are a number of questions um, and I think we can answer with yes or no answers in the Q&A, such as, you know, needing a um, an EORI number to use GVMS and I understand the answer is yes. So if we could uh, use some more of your time perhaps to provide answers in to some of those Q&As while I now introduce colleagues from the Department of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, commonly known as DEFRA. Today we have uh, Lee Gunton presenting and he's uh, joined with, by Jason Pollock and Jack Tilbury, um, experts in plants and animals respectively. So I'm expecting that they'll be able to answer lots of your questions as well after their presentation. And um, after them, we will have um, Juao from the Food Standards Agency. And following that whole session, we'll have a Q&A facilitated by Neil Walker, the Head of Infrastructure Energy um, and in the Environment at IBEC. Thank you all. Great. Thank you very much, Margaret, for that introduction. Um, it's Lee Gunton here from the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Um, I will be taking you through um, the staged approach um, that has been previously mentioned in regards to sanitary and phytosanitary goods and other controlled goods too. Um, I've got a lot of ground to cover um, and not much time to do it, so apologies if um, I, I uh, run through it quite quickly, um, but you will be receiving the slides afterwards, so um, hopefully you'll have all the information in these um, to go away and look at after the session. Um, if we could have the next uh, two slides, please. Um, you'll be able to see the agenda. Um, apologies that you can't see me. Um, I uh, unfortunately don't have the correct technology uh, for you to be able to do that, um, but hopefully um, you can all hear me OK. Um, the agenda shows what I'll be touching on. I'll be starting with the new SPS regime, um, firstly starting with EU GB movements um, and covering off plants, um, animals and their products, um, and then IT systems uh, before moving on to SPS again, but with GB to EU movements too. Um, I'll then be going into other uh, controlled goods such as CITES, the Convention for International Trade in Endangered Species, uh, food labour, labelling, geographical indicators, wood packaging materials, timber and chemicals. So next slide please, if we can start with the introduction to the phased approach um, of SPS goods. So new sa sanitary and phytosanitary controls will apply to goods imported to GB from the EU from the 1st of January 2021. As you've already heard, uh, the UK government is introducing these controls in stages up to July 2021 with different controls being introduced at each stage for different commodities. The controls being introduced will include import pre-notification, health certification, documentary ID and physical checks, plus entry via a, port of entry, a point of entry with an appropriate border control post or BCP with relevant checking facilities from uh, July 2021. Next slide, please. So for plants and plant products, uh, there'll be a requirement for pre-notification and phytosanitary certificates for high priority plants and plant products from the 1st of January. These SPS checks will take place away from the border at places of destination or other approved premises. And you can find an exhaustive list of the high priority plants and their products um, on gov.uk at the moment. This list details all plants for planting, where potatoes, some seed, timber and used agricultural or forestry machinery. Uh, which you will have to um, include pre-notification and phytosanitary certificates for from the 1st of January. The requirement for pre-notification and the certificates is extended to all regulated plants and their products, uh, so not just those categorised as high, high risk from April 2021. We've published a full list of commodities that are not regulated on the gov.uk website as well. Um, and if the commodity is not mentioned on that list, um, then it will need the certificate. From July 2021, there will be an increased number of physical and ID checks, and all of those will then take place at border control posts. Next slide, please. And so after the transition period ends on the 1st of January, pre-notification and phytosanitary certificates will be required for those high priority uh, plants and their products. 
um, documentary checks will be carried out remotely. Physical checks will be carried out on high priority plants, uh, which are not subject to systemic import checks now, but do constitute high risk pathways. Physical checks will take place at destination again. EU exporters will need to apply for uh, a phytosanitary certificate from the relevant competent authority of the EU country of origin. This will need to be secured prior to the goods departure so that it can be sent to the importer for pre-notification purposes. Importers will need to submit import notifications at least four hours prior to arrival if travelling by air or at least one working day prior to arrival by all other modes of transport, along with the phytosanitary certificate that is. These checks will then be carried out by plant health and seed inspectors from the Animal and Plant Health Agency and the Forestry Commission in England and Wales and the Scottish Government in Scotland. Next slide, we will go on to uh, from the 1st of April, um, which introduces further changes. Um, and so from the 1st of April, all regulated plants and their products will require pre-notification and to be accompanied by a phytosanitary certificate. From July, physical checks for plants and their products will increase. Uh, commodities subject to SPS controls will need to enter by, via a point of entry with an appropriate BCP, uh, which has all the relevant checking facilities. And you can find a list of those border control posts uh, on gov.uk at the moment too, uh, which will be updated before the 1st of January as well. All ID and physical checks for plants and their products it will move to border control posts from July um, and these will either be existing ports of entry uh, or at new inland sites. Next slide. Um, so what do these physical checks actually look like? Um, most of these checks on high priority plants and their products from the EU will take place based on risk away from the border initially. The level of checks will increase for plants and their products where there's an opportunity to better mitigate existing risks from the EU. Plants and plant products will be physically checked by examining the contents of the consignments to ensure there's no evidence of the presence of harmful plant pests and diseases. Goods subject to physical checks will not always be sampled for lab testing. This is performed on a random basis or if non-compliance is su suspected. Or if the goods are subject to compulsory lab testing or if pathogens are, su are suspected, which may be latent or are displaying no visual symptoms. Importers uh, will uh, be subject to fees applied for checks on EU imports, as is the case from imports from non-EU countries now. Uh, and for plants and their products, a common import regime will ultimately apply to all third countries. So any uh, changes will apply equally to EU and non-EU countries. The next slide, we'll be moving on to uh, live animals and their animal products. Um, and so as a business preparing to export animals and their products to Great Britain, you'll need to be aware of these following changes introduced again in phases from January to July 2021. From the 1st of January, for live animals and their products, pre-notification and health certificates will be required for all live animals. And a pre-notification will be need, need to be submitted at least one working day in advance of the arrival at the port, port point of entry. Any product of animal origin subject to safeguard measures will need to be pre-notified in advance and be accompanied by the relevant health certificate. This safeguard action can be taken at very short notice to prohibit or restrict imports of certain products from certain countries following an outbreak of disease or a public health issue. Uh, Sorry, do bear with me. Um, as the exporter, you'll be responsible for ensuring the relevant health certificate travels with the consignment. The UK government already carries out physical checks on live animals, and these will continue to be carried out at destination. Animal byproducts will continue with the requirement to be accompanied by official commercial documentation, and high risk animal byproducts will require the importer to obtain pre authorization, and high risk animal byproducts in category three processed animal protein will also require pre-notification in advance. Uh, more uh, information on what con constitutes a high risk animal byproduct can be found in the border operating model, as well as all of the other um, commodities that I touch on in this presentation. Next slide, um, we'll focus on the April changes, which will be uh, from the 1st of April, all products of animal origin will require pre-notification via IPAS, um, this is the import of products, animals, food and feed system. 
this system will be used by GB importers to pre-notify SPS imports. More detail will be uh, covered in this later on. While the GB importer must make the notification to IPAS, as the exporter, you will be required to obtain the relevant health documentation and ensure that it travels with the consignment. The process is introduced on the 1st of January for live animals, high-risk animal byproducts and POAO, subject to safeguard measures, will continue until, uh, through until uh, July 2021. Next slide, from the 1st of July, all live animals and POAO will require pre-notification using IPAS and must be accompanied by an export health certificate. They will be required to enter via an established POE with an appropriate border control post with the relevant checking facilities. Animal byproducts must be accompanied by an export health certificate or other official documentation, depending on the animal byproduct commodity being imported. Certain ABP will need to arrive at an established POE with an appropriate border control post, and certain animal byproducts will require pre notification. Again, as the EU exporter, you must ensure the correct documentation travels with the consignments. ID and physical checks of POAO and ABP will be introduced at uh, this stage of July 2021, and all ID and physical checks for animal products will move, move to border control posts. POAO, germinal products and animal byproducts imported from the EU will be subject to a minimum level of 1% physical checks. All high-risk live animals will, con will continue to be checked. Some commodities such as shellfish, fish and uh, certain animal byproducts will be subject to higher minimum level checks. It's worth noting that during 2021, controls will be reviewed in light of existing and new trade agreements and any changes in risk, risk status. Following this review, any further, further changes will be introduced after January 2022. Moving on for POAO uh, fishery products, um, existing import rules will apply for imports of fishery products and live bivalve mollusks for human consumption until April 2021. Catch certificates and other IUU documents, such as processing statements and storage documents, will, however, be subject to checks from January 2021. GB importers should note that where intended for direct human consumption, live animals are treated as products and not as live animals, such as live lobsters or mollusks moving directly to the final consumer. And I understand that most of you probably aren't the GB importer in this process, but it may be useful for you to uh, note what uh, your GB import partners will be doing uh, on the other side of the border. And so from April 2021, Fishery products and live bivalve mollusks for human consumption will be subject to import controls in line with those applying to animal products. From April again, there will be new requirements for importers to submit pre notifications for fishery products via IPAS in advance of the goods arrival, as per rules for POAO. From July 2021, fishery products and live bivalve mollusks for human consumption will be subject to import controls in line with those applying to animal products again. These include the requirements for EHCs, export health certificates, import pre notifications, and entry via an established POE with an appropriate border control post again. Next slide, please. These two slides will then cover the IPAS system. And so I have covered that. Um, the system is already live and is being used for notification of live animals, germinal products, and animal byproducts traveling on uh, certain health certificates, the inter-trade animal health certificates and other commercial documents uh, alongside traces. From 2021, IPAS will be used to pre-notify UK officials and other official bodies before goods subject uh, to SPS controls enter Great Britain from the EU in a phased approach, starting with live animals, germinal products and animal byproducts in January. Next slide goes into further detail, um, but simply IPAS will replace traces for GB importers. To support trade readiness and the adoption of IPAS ahead of the end of the transition period, a phased migration is planned. IPAS is already live for live animals, animal byproducts and germinal products for EU and EEA countries, but products of animal origin, high risk food and feed not of animal origin will start from the 1st of April 2020. Plants and plant products will be introduced from the 1st of February 2021, with the final date to be confirmed. But uh, 
just to note, I've had full go live for non-EU and non-EEA countries at different dates. Next slide, please. We'll then be moving on for to movements from GB to the EU. Um, and I'll talk you through the SPS uh, live animals um, and plants and their products um, before moving on to the other controlled goods. So the process for exporting um, of live animals and their products into the EU from GB involves the following steps shown on the slide. GB importers must pre-notify on traces and upload a copy of the export health certificate. You should ensure that the GB exporter sends the original export health certificate. GB exporters can obtain these uh, EHCs via EHC online. This should be completed by an official vet veterinarian or food competence certifying officer who will verify that health conditions outlined in EU regulations are met. More information on EHCs can be found on the gov.uk website. You should plan for the logistics provider to enter the EU through a border control post and this BCP should be notified by an EU-based importer or import agent prior to arrival. For live animals, that notification needs to happen at least 24 hours in advance of arrival. And also please note that certificates for live aquatic animals are not available on EHC online. Uh, so I will discuss the process for live uh, aquatic animals in the next slide. For these animals, you should plan for the logistics provider to enter the EU through a border control post, which should be notified by an EU-based importer or import agent prior to arrival. Any necessary CITES permits should be attained before shipment. Live aquatic animals, such as ornamental fish and certain live bivalve mollusks, need to be certified by a fish health inspector. These are employed by the Centre for Environment, Fisheries and Agriculture, Science in England and Wales and Marine Scotland. These organisations also provide the relevant export health certificates. Um, otherwise, they will be uh, provided by the Animal and Plant Health Agency via EHC online. Next slide uh, will show uh, POAO uh, export of fishery products and live shellfish from GB to EU. So again, you should plan with logistics providers to enter the EU through an appropriate border control post. And again, the GB-based exporter will need to pre-notify the EU via Traces NT. The consignment must be accompanied by an export health certificate, uh, the responsibility of the GB exporter, and then completed by a local authority food competence cert certifying officer, or an OV. They will ensure that the products meet the health conditions outlined in EU regulations again. The GB exporter will need to send the UK validated catch certificate along with a copy of the export health certificate to the EU importer. Note that these catch, there are some catch certificate exemptions for farmed or freshwater fish or shellfish and some mollusks. Next slide, please. I've touched on certification in previous slides, but I'll now briefly summarise the different certification requirements for SPS exports from GB to EU. The Export Health Certificate Online Service will be used to control the safe export of live animals, POAO, and other animals and uh, plants and their products. The system allows exporters to apply for EHCs and phytosanitary certificates online. Again, the system is already used uh, live and is uh, being rolled out to replace the largely manual rest of world export health certification process. After the transition period, the EU will require GB exporters to have EHCs and phyto phytosanitary certificates. From the 1st of January, traders will be able to apply for most of their health and phytosanitary certificates on the EHC online, um, and you'll need to compete, complete an EHC for each type of animal or product exported from the UK. So that concludes this uh, section of the presentation that deals with changes to the SBS regime. However, I'm now going to talk about additional agri-food issues such as labelling and packaging requirements, starting with CITES. So after the transition period ends on the 1st of January, the UK will continue to comply with the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, otherwise known as CITES. All species of animals and plants listed under CITES will require CITES permits and or import notification. Moving any species controlled under CITES between EU and the GB, um, between Northern Ireland and GB, including via post, will need to comply with the same requirements as those in place for movement between the UK and non-EU countries. Arrangements for movement directly between Northern Ireland and the EU will not change. 
only certain UK land, sea, airports can be used for point of entry or exit from moving sites listed animals or plants or their products. You must obtain the necessary CITES documents from the UK Management Authority, which is the Animal and Plant Health Agency, prior to the import of CITES into the UK. And you must apply for this documentation as soon as possible. Next slide, please. I'll now take you through the changes to food labelling that will need to be made for food marketed in the UK. And we'll be continuing to update the guidance on the changes required from the 1st of January on the gov.uk website. The link is available in this presentation. But broadly, the changes that we're making in Great Britain include origin labelling, requirements around the business responsible for food information, and use of logos and health marks. After the transition period ends, the UK government is aiming wherever possible to allow a period of adjustment for labelling changes in relation to goods produced or imported and placed on the GB market. The period of adjustment will be for 21 months until the 30th of September 2022. Goods sold in Northern Ireland will continue to follow EU rules for labelling, but you need, may need to make some labelling changes. For placing food onto the EU market from GB, I'd encourage you to read the link in this slide to, uh, to advice issues by the European Commission. And based on this, UK businesses will need to make required changes in order to place food on the EU market when the transition period has ended. Next slide. So for pre-packaged foods and uh, cases, the rules are changing on food business operator addresses from January, where you will be required to have a, either a UK address. Uh, this can be the address of the food business operator in the UK, or if they're not established in the UK, you can use the address of the food importer. You can also use an EU address of either a food business operator established in the EU, or if the FBO is not established in the EU, you can use the address of the importer of the food. From the 1st of October 2022, you will need a UK address. And where both a UK and an EU address are used, the label will be acceptable at all times. And we're continuing con to consider arrangements for the Northern Ireland market and we'll update industry with detailed guidance as soon as we are able to do so. Moving on, certain foods, including meat, most meat and uh, either fresh or frozen, honey and olive oil are required to have origin labels. When the ingredient is from more than one country, regulations that allow the origin to be summarised using non-country specific terms or origin indicators. And please refer to the guidance on gov.uk to see what is required on the GB market after the 1st of January. Next slide, the final slide on food labelling, um, which outlines the changes for UK food placed on the EU market when the transition period ends. Again, this will be shared for you to review at your own pace. But broadly, the EU organic logo is EU owned and the EU has set strict rules in respect of its use. Um, on leaving the EU at the end of the transition period, the UK will not meet the requirements to use the logo. The UK is aiming to be recognised by the EU um, as having equivalence to organic standards and established reciprocal arrangements. If agreement is reached, use of the EU logo will be allowed on an optional basis as it is now. Um, and also the food business operator is the business under whose name the food is marketed. Um, the requirement to be established means that the FBO has a physical presence by way of a unit of a food business in the EU27, and a label which carries the dual address of an FBO based in the UK and one based in the EU will ensure address requirements are met for both markets, allowing the product to be marketed in both EU27 countries and the United Kingdom. The next two slides will cover geographical indicators. I'll try to rattle through these pretty quickly, but uh, the UK government will establish new UK geographical indications schemes by the end of the transition period. There will be four schemes covering food and agricultural products, spirits, wines, and aromatized wines. The United Kingdom framework will comply with the World Trade Organization agreement on trade related aspects of intellectual property rights. Not all UK products currently protected under the EU's GI schemes will continue to be protected under the UK GI schemes, including Irish whiskey, Irish protein and Irish quick cream, which are GIs that can be produced anywhere on the island of Ireland. UK GI schemes will welcome applications from both UK and non-UK applicants from the day they enter into force and will publish further guidance on these schemes at the end of the transition period. 
next slide covers um, a few brief questions. Uh, but as to the question of whether EU products will be protected in the UK, we of course intend to honour our legal obligations under the withdrawal agreement. And the slide covers other frequently asked questions, which uh, you can read in your own time. The next slide um, has some information on wood packaging material. Um, and so I will just briefly cover this, um, but after the end of the transition period, all wood packaging material moving from GB to the EU and from EU to the GB must be treated and appropriately marked in compliance with uh, ISPM 15 international standards. Um, this happens by undergoing heat treatment and marking. There's a link on this slide that outlines the requirements, but broadly this is in line with international requirements for trade and is in place to protect our environment from pests and diseases. By definition, WPM includes pallets, crates, boxes, cable drums, spools and dunnage uh, too. DEFRA has been working um, with the wood packaging material industry to uh, develop policies which will ensure our biosecurity is maintained and trade continues to flow with a li as little disruption as possible. DEFRA, the Forestry Commission and other relevant UK plant health authorities are working closely with the WPM material sector to understand what actions they need to take to manage this new requirement by the end of the transition period. And we have been working tirelessly with industry to both increase the UK stock of compliant wood packaging material and to increase our UK wood packaging material treatment capacity by increasing the number of heat treatment facilities and their hours of operations, um, but also by simplifying and improving ISPM 15 processes. Next slide, please. Moving on from WPM to timber, the UK is committed to tackling the trade in illegal timber through the UK timber regulations. These regulations prohibit the placing of illegally harvest harvested timber on the market and lays out the duties of the operators, those placing timber on the UK market for the first time, and traders, those who buy and sell timber already on the market. Operators are required to exercise due diligence to ensure that timber placed on the market has not been harvested illegally. From the 1st of January, operators placing timber on the EU market will have to exercise due diligence on timber from the UK and the rest of the world under the European timber regulations. This will include timber harvested in the UK and timber from third countries that have been placed on the UK market. Likewise, operators placing timber on the UK market will have to exercise due diligence on timber from the EU and the rest of the world under the UK timber regulations. To do this, they'll require supply chain information from EU sellers sellers. The due diligence requirement is not new. What has changed but is that there will now be an EU market and a UK market. Those importing timber just need to check the requirements under the respective timber regulations and act accordingly. Next slide please. I'll now move on to cover chemicals but from the 1st of January 2021 GB will, will replace EU chemicals regulations with an independent regulatory framework called UK REACH. Importers and manufacturers of chemicals will assume new responsibilities under the UK REACH from the end of the transition period. And the UK REACH IT system, comply with UK REACH, is ready to support the registration of chemicals in the UK from the end of the transition period. It will retain the fundamental principles of EU REACH, including the no data, no market principle, the precautionary principle and the last resort principle on animal testing. Although both GB and the EU will operate REACH frameworks, the two systems will not be in any way linked. Businesses must ensure that regulatory requirements are fulfilled on both sides of the channel. As under EU REACH, it is possible for the non-UK companies to fulfil these obligations through use of an only representative under UK REACH. In the context of exports from the EU into GB, substances must be covered by a valid UK REACH registration in advance of any checks carried out at the border. For imports into the EU from GB, the EU REACH registrations will no longer be valid at the end of the transition period. They must be transferred to an EU-based legal entity to allow continued import of some substances into the EEA. Next slide, um, and the final slide for me, um, in order for EU businesses to access the market in Great Britain, they must follow one of the following two options for chemicals, this is. The first option is for your GB customer to register the substance under UK REACH. The notification provision is available for your GB downstream users to ensure continuity of supply at the end of the transition period. 
The second option is for EEA exporters who can register the substance under UK REACH by using a GB-based entity. This either has to be a GB-based only representative or an affiliate GB importer. Your GB downstream users may make use of the notification process to ensure compliance in the interim between the end of the transition period and registration obligations being taken up by your GB-based entity. If the EEA exporter takes on registration obligations via a GB-based entity, their GB customers will retain their downstream users' status. The UK already has in place some of the highest environmental standards in the world. The UK is a member of international agreements such as the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Conventions, and we will continue to uphold our international commitments. You should be confident that the UK will maintain a high regulatory environmental standards now that we have left the European Union. That's it uh, from me. Uh, apologies, that was quite a whirlwind um, of uh, different commodities. But uh, for now, I'll hand over to my colleague in the Food Standards Agency um, and be able to answer any of your questions alongside my colleagues uh, a little bit later. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you. Um, so my name is uh, Joao Vieira and I'm uh, Imports Delivery Officer at uh, the UK's Food Standards Agency or FSA. Um, and uh, in the FSA, uh, we have a responsibility for imported food safety in relation to the protection of UK consumers. And this includes policy responsibility for imported high risk food and feed not of animal origin. Um, I'm going to uh, now start to, to say high risk FNAO. Um, and we have the policy responsibility in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. The next slide, please. Okay, so um, during this present presentation, I will briefly explain the new import, import requirements for high risk FNAOs uh, imported uh, from the EU and uh, that will be introduced uh, from January 2021. And then I will highlight the changes um, uh, on the import requirements through the, the different milestones of the phased introduction. So January, April and July. First of all, I want to uh, uh, remind you of what it is uh, high risk FNAO. So high risk FNAO are, uh, describes a specific food and feed product that is uh, not of animal origin from specific non-EU countries where a particular hazard has been identified. And um, when uh, that hazard has been identified and, uh, and it has been assessed uh, as it needs to have uh, to be subject to additional import requirements, uh, it's included in EU legislation. Um, it's important to notice that it's a, it's a binary in the sense that it's um, a specific uh, food or feed product, not of animal origin, uh, coming from a specific non-EU country. Um, so uh, by definition, uh, there are no high-risk FNAOs coming from the EU. Of course, that will change in the future when the UK leaves um, when the, uh, the transition period ends. So, for example, a risk of a, a, an example of a high risk FNAO includes uh, groundnuts. So, for example, uh, groundnuts uh, coming from certain countries um, are a high risk FNAO due to the risk of aflatoxins, but groundnuts coming from other um, countries are not a high risk. So, uh, I, I, I remind you of this because it is important um, uh, that you know that it is the responsibility of the importers to identify whether uh, any food or feed of non-animal origin is high risk and therefore subject to additional import requirements. Um, I will put in the chat um, um, a list that can be found in the website of uh, the FSA where you can see um, all the high-risk food and feed uh, products of non-animal origin. So, uh, as you can see here, uh, in Gen January 2021, uh, there will be no new import requirements on high-risk FNAOs from the rest of the world that are imported into the EU and then exported into GB. Uh, so, just 
to to clarify uh, in this presentation we'll be um, we'll be discussing mostly four types of movement so high risk fnaos coming from the rest of the world directly to um, the uk uh, high risk fnaos from the rest of the world that are first imported into the eu and then they are exported into the uk um, rest of the world high risk fnaos that um, go through the EU but as a direct transit into the UK and then in the future if um, uh, if, if there are uh, Irish FNEOs from uh, the EU uh, that will be uh, exported into GB so um, for the uh, rest of the world Irish FNEOs transiting through EU to GB they have to be pre-notified uh, pre on IPAS enter GB via a BCP, a BCP, of course, uh, approved uh, for controls. Sorry, can you go to the, the previous slide? Thank you. So um, so the rest of the world, uh, Iris Kefaneos transiting through EU to GB must be pre-notified on IPAS, enter GB via a BCP approved for uh, control of high risk FNAOs and be subject to import checks. Why? Because uh, when uh, the UK leaves um, the single market, the EU will not uh, uh, check uh, these consignments, which uh, uh, they were done uh, before. And so um, um, the G uh, GB will have to uh, uh, check them. Um, the only change for uh, 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 Irish FNAOs coming from the rest of the world directly into the GB, the only thing that will change is uh, that pre-notification will be done via iPads instead of uh, traces. Um, next slide, please. In April 2021, uh, um, pre-notification on iPads will be required for all high-risk uh, high FNAOs um, coming from the EU, meaning uh, uh, high-risk FNAOs that are from, a uh, from the rest of the world, imported into the EU and then exported to um, uh, GB. These uh, will have to be um, uh, pre-notified uh, on IPAS, mostly uh, because we need that information because we will lose the access to uh, the RAS system. Uh, and so we need that information. Uh, for April 2021, no other imports, um, uh, no, no, nothing else will change. And again, these goods, even if they have to be pre-notified, they will still uh, uh, continue to enter GB through any entry point. Next slide. Thank you. So from July 2021 and the last phase of uh, the last phase of this phased approach, uh, all high-risk uh, uh, FNAO uh, has to uh, enter GB via a BCP. Uh, again, uh, the BCP with the relevant approval. If you um, that information on uh, which BCPs are approved for high-risk. Uh, FNAO, you, you can see in the uh, UK's government website, uh, or if you just go in Google and put UK BCP, and it will be uh, the first uh, result. Um, so in July, all uh, IRIS FNAO uh, has to uh, enter GB via a BCP, and it will uh, have to, of course, be pre notified on IPAS and subject to the uh, imp uh, to import controls. This includes uh, the uh, high-risk FNAOs that are imported into the EU and then exported into uh, uh, GB. Um, and this, of course, uh, means that they also have to have all the relevant uh, documentation that may include certifi certificates of laboratory analysis and an official certificate for certain commodities. It's also uh, really important to, um, to, to notice that if um, uh, high-risk FNAOs are imported into the EU and then reprocessed, 
before being uh, exported to GB, they will still be subject to imp uh, GB import requirements if the final product contains 20% or more of a listed high-risk FNAO as an ingredient. Uh, finally, uh, uh, as, I, as I spoke in terms of the definition of high-risk FNAO, right now the, the, there are no um, high-risk FNAOs from the EU. Uh, that might change at the end of the transition period uh, uh, because the responsibility for determining import requirements um, for high-risk FNAOs uh, into GB uh, will will fall into FSA's responsibility. Uh, this list will uh, be uh, reviewed regularly based on uh, uh, evidence and the scientific assessment and commodities will be added or removed from the list and frequency might uh, change. Uh, this means that um, the list um, that the EU currently has uh, will probably diverge from the from the list that the UK will have um, in the future. So again, uh, uh, let me remind you that if you want to uh, import uh, food and feed uh, products of non-animal uh, origin, just please um, look at the uh, high risk uh, list uh, in the in FSA's website to see if there are um, import um, requirements uh, for those commodities. Thank you. Thank you, Joao. Um, it's Margaret again. Um, that's a lot of detail for everybody. I hope you all had a coffee this morning. But um, now in a correction to earlier, I'd like to hand over to uh, Paul Kelly, who's the Director of Food and Drink Ireland at IBEC, um, to facilitate their, your key questions and get some answers from our friends in DEFRA and the FSA. Thank you. Thanks very much, Margaret, and uh, a big thank you as well to Joe and to Lee before him for a very, very detailed uh, presentations. A lot of questions and queries, I think, have come in. Um, I don't think we're going to get to them all in the time that's available. So one of the things we'll commit to doing in Food Drink Ireland in, in IBEC is to take the questions offline afterwards and follow up directly with DEFRA and FSA and uh, then communicate all the answers to members afterwards. A lot of questions I think to do with health certificates, so maybe just an initial one uh, would be when will the UK list EU and therefore Irish plants and then um, when will the actual model health certificate be available? Hi all, uh, thank you for that Lee here again. Um, obviously more than happy to take away any questions that we don't get to now um but just uh, so i'm aware i i'm i'm so you're aware i'm not a uh, policy uh, specialist in these areas um jack and um jordan are um i'm not sure if they're on the line though jack would you be able to answer this question Lee, you've got Jason here from the, the, the phytosanitary side, so I can perhaps ask, answer that question from the plant perspective, if that's helpful. Perfect, thank you. Cool, so from the phytosanitary side, um, there's a list on gov.uk in terms of what uh, high priority plants uh, will be required. In terms of the certificates, because plants are uh, sort of bound by the IPPC, there's a, a set format that all sort of phytosanitary certificates will need to follow. So it's a little bit different from from the animal side in that there doesn't have to be a specific uh, health certificate health certificate for each um, commodity. But like you say, we we run by sort of the ISPM standards um, in terms of what our phytosanitary certificates. Uh, will look like. But if you go on to uh, gov.uk uh, for the plants and plants products uh, transition period, there'll be a list of um, what those high priority plants are that will require a phytosanitary certificate. From the Sorry, I was actually getting my, my language mixed up. I meant uh, export established, I meant plants as in sort of an export factory or an export establishment. Oh, okay. Unfortunately, I won't be able to answer that one. I do apologise. Okay, and um, do we know when the, the health certificate itself will, will actually be available? I think if we don't have uh, Jack on the line, then we may have to take that one away, I'm afraid. So I think they, 
the health certificates, um, there may be versions available on gov.uk now, but they will be uh, broadly based on the EU health certificates at the moment. So um, if you do need uh, any guidance, I'd start off with the EU ones, um, and we don't expect there to be many changes on those. Um, but further information will be uh, released uh, close to the end of the transition period. Of OK, I have, a num I have a number of specific questions then on the, the certificates them themselves. Um, you may be able to answer some. If not, we can maybe get follow up afterwards. Uh, the first one, I suppose, would be, will, will a health cert be required for each container load? Or if a consignment consists of more than one container load, will it be one cert uh, for the consignment or a cert for each uh, container load? Uh, the second one then was, are retailers going to be required to have health certs for composite meals been exported from GB to Northern Ireland? Um, will there be a need for health certs for goods transiting from ROI to the rest of the EU via the land bridge or will wider GB SPS control requirements be required? So there's a few more but I might maybe just start with those three initially. Thank you for those. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to be um, straight up and say that uh, without uh, Jack, our um, uh, SPS animals uh, kind of lead, um, I, I won't be able to give you detailed on answers on those, unfortunately, but hopefully Jack, who will be joining uh, for the Q&A plenary session, will be able to shed more light on them. With regards to the first question, I believe it will be a catch certificate for each consignment rather than the actual uh, load, but um, Jack should be able to confirm that. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I don't have any more information on uh, the second or the third question, um, but uh, we will obviously take these away if we aren't able to provide you with answers of them uh, before the end of the session. That's great. Uh, and we have a couple of more, even more technical ones, which I maybe will not go into at this stage, but are, are quite important. So we can we can come back to them either later or in the, the follow up afterwards. Just maybe moving on then to uh, non um, certificate related uh, questions. And it's a couple of couple of queries have come in just in relation to labeling and, and labeling changes, particularly in relation to um, goods for Northern Ireland uh, and will there be any grace period allowed for labelling changes? So I'm thinking along the lines of the requirement to have either an NI or an EU address after the 1st of January. And obviously we're only 60 days out from, from it at this stage. Yeah, thank you. That is a, that is a great question. Um, I unfortunately, I have a lot of information in front of me. I can't um, provide you uh, with an answer right now, but um, I will certainly um, get looking and then um, hopefully be able to provide you with uh, an answer for the plenary session, I'm afraid. Great. And then just another one then, just to, to confirm, I think it was mentioned there in one of the slides that the ISPM 15 heat treated pallets will not be required um, after the 1st of January. Is that, that the case for uh, imports into uh, GB? Uh, no, so my understanding is that you will require ISPM 15 um, heat treated pallets from the 1st of January. Um, after the end of the transition period, all WPM moving from GB to the EU and EU GB must be treated and appropriately, appropriately marked in uh, compliance with those standards. OK, and if that's the case then, and if the SPS checks will be taking effect from the 1st of July, what will happen in the six month period? Will it be, as you, you sort of described earlier in the presentation, that they will be potentially checked at the point of destination? Uh, yes, I believe that to be correct. Um, if they are, yes, yes. Great. Another question then on, on labelling, is, is a PO box address acceptable for labelling purposes? Initially, I'm not sure whether it is acceptable. I think it does actually have to be a uh, an actual place where um, the someone can be contacted, um, and so we can trace the supply chain back if there is an issue with that consignment. Um, so I'm not sure that it will be. Uh, it will have to be an actual um, kind of business or, or a place um, where there are people that can be contacted easily. Great, thank you. And a question then just on the border control posts for products of animal origin uh, entering from Ireland. Obviously reference was, was made to, to Hollyhead and, and the work that was that was being done around that. Will there be any others? Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, so the border control posts for products of animal origin uh, entering from Ireland, uh, reference was made to the, the work that's that's ongoing at Hollyhead. Will there be any other border control posts from entry points in, from Ireland? 
particularly in southern Wales? So um, these are still um, kind of being being finalised in Wales, uh, but we are looking into um, other sites in Wales for border control posts um, and hope to have more information on these um, kind of shortly. Um, but it, it, it is looking likely there will be some kind of provision. Great, and then I think um, just going through the questions here, and I may, you may have picked up some, I've, I've, I've missed them since maybe just at the start of our discussion here now, but how will Northern Ireland origin food product be labelled as to origin for EU and for rest of world? Uh, apologies, I'm not a Northern Ireland expert. I, I can't give you any information on that. Um, I hope the other colleagues might be able to see later. That's that's great. Uh, I think that's the the bulk of the questions. As as I mentioned, there's quite a lot there on uh, certification, which I think sort of um, indicates how important an issue it is for for many of of our members certainly. So hopefully we'll get maybe some some additional uh, detail in the plenary Q Q and A, and obviously we'd be more than happy to uh, follow follow up uh, after this uh, session as well. Yeah, Thank completely, you. Paul. Apologies, I can't give you any further information, uh, but anything that we don't answer today, we will, of course, take away and uh, get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you. Thanks, all. Um, I think now we're going to move on to our colleagues in the Department of Transport, and we will have a follow-up Q&A from them with um, Neil Walker, the Head of Infrastructure from IBEG. Thank you. Um, we can't hear you, Mike. If you can move the slides on. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the ambassador um, outlined uh, the UK government position generally towards negotiations. So I think we can skip on from this slide, but we are working very hard to ensure that transport um, services can continue through um, uh, in from January the 1st, 2021. Um, so the main thing <clears throat> that I wanted to focus on today was around a new web service known as the Check and HGV is ready to cross the border. Um, so this will help continued um, flow of RORO freight um, in the short straits mainly. Um, so be introduced for uh, goods and vehicles leaving Great Britain for the EU um, and will help ensure that only vehicles carrying the right documentation and customs import export um, paperwork for, for the EU's import controls um, when they're leaving the Kent uh, ports. Um, so the government intends to make use of the web service a legal requirement for HGVs over 7.5 tonnes that are travelling outbound from Great Britain via either the port of Dover or Eurotunnel. So it means that the service will issue a Kent access permit digitally to um, every HGV um, for which the information has been successfully provided. So there's a link here, but I'm not sure we have time, <clears throat> but generally you can check it later. It's a checklist of all the different documentation that you may need, depending on the types of goods that you are carrying from GB to the EU. And if you, it's a traffic light system. So if you get a green light, you'll be issued with this Kent access permit um, to prove that you are allowed to legally travel into Kent to the ports or to Eurotunnel. Um, and if you get an amber or red, then it will give you advice on how you can um, make sure you have the right documentation before you set off, um, because this is linked to Operation Brock, which is on the next slide, which is a traffic management system that will operate in Kent. Um, and so you can't enter into Operation Brock uh, if you do not have a, camp, a Kent access permit. Um, and those that try to enter Kent without a permit will um, face fines of £300. So next slide, please. So as I said, Operation Bronx, we're working with the local um, Kent Resilience Forum um, to make sure that our uh, traffic management plans for Kent 
um, are kind of ready for um, the end of the transition period. Um, we're also looking at updating um, some secondary um, legislation to um, make sure, as I said, that HGV service is mandatory for all HGVs travelling into Kent and that we prioritise live and fresh seafood and day-old chicks through Operation Brock queues if there are delays and that we will update through the secondary legislation road layouts to um, reflect potential changes um, that will come in as a result of Operation Brock. Um, and as I said, if uh, hauliers, drivers um, try to enter Kent without a Kent access permit, then they could face on the spot fines of £300. So this system will be hosted on gov.uk and we can, um, when we share the slides uh, after this um, uh, conference, we um, you can check out the demo site. Um, and as I say, it's a kind of very simple step-by-step -step process um, to help drivers and traders prepare for um, EU import control. So it's only for GB to EU movements. Um, and that is, all I had to say, but I think we have a Q&A session now, so if there are questions, um, we can take those. Hey. Hi, good afternoon. Well, good, good morning, sir. Uh, Neil Walker here from IBEC. I head up the infrastructure team, which includes transport. So. Uh, there are a number of questions uh, that were posed in advance. Um, I don't see any up yet on the, the live event, so we'll, we'll kick off for those. The first one, and I think it's been partially addressed in the previous session, is is there any advice for Irish businesses moving goods into GB via Northern Ireland? For example, from Donegal, would we'll be passing through into Scotland. Yeah, so I think that is a question for my BPDG colleagues. I'm not sure who was on the line to support. Um, so, uh, Neil, sorry, the, the lorry would be coming from Donegal through Northern Ireland into GB. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Well, OK, so I, I think that that's probably what we covered with Mark and Ellie this morning, that I, I think um, so. that movement through and very um, Yes, we're expecting. <laughs> so we're probably looking at transit and all sorts of other things there too, and the, the yeah, various possibilities. Yeah. yeah and the related question about whether export declarations would be required for such goods. Again, I think that has probably been previously covered. So we might move on to to the main course, as it were, which <laughs> is there have been some concerns expressed. Um, in fact, we ran a, an event previously looking at the Irish ports. Uh, but there were uh, there have been some concerns expressed by freight hauliers in particular, and there was major coverage in one of the Sunday newspapers this weekend about the readiness or otherwise of the ports facing the Irish Sea. So, uh, in particular, um, uh, Holyhead. And um, previously, it was mentioned that a site is being developed on Anglesey. Whereas the, the newspaper report suggested that three sites have been looked at and they'd all been rejected. So it, it would be great to have some kind of clarity on is it going to be Warrington for the first six months, um, which is a, it's a great location. It's well connected to the M62, the M56, the M6, but it is two hours from Holyhead. So Margaret, I think that's another question. Yes, um, and apologies, I, I won't be able to give you an answer immediately, but I, I can uh, try and establish for the plenary session as to when we might expect to be able to let you know all of that, Neil. I mean, we recognise very much that everybody needs to understand where they're going on day one, and that's why the government has taken the staged approach. And I, um, I have on my horizon the issues with the uh, sites uh, leading up to Hollyhead, but let me uh, come back to you in the plenary and see what we can get to. Okay. It's, Thank you. It's still uh, here. Margaret. Oh, lovely study you're in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I do. I do have. I do have some information on this, but I, I think there are other bits that we probably need, do need to check out and come back to later. On the Hollyhead sites, we had three three sites potentially to use. One has been discounted because it is. Um, 
I think 96% certain that it is of um, archaeological interest and significance. Uh, of the other two, one is expected that it might also be of archaeological um, interest. And, and so there are concerns about going with that one in case we get started and then um, find something that, that causes us to, to stop. And the third site, unlikely to have any archaeological interest, but it is, however, on a slope. So um, the decision was planned for about a fortnight ago, but there has been additional work done on um, engineering impacts uh, to make sure that we can safely um, manage that that site before any final decision is made. Um, and there is a, a board today at which we're hoping that there will be enough information in order for that final decision to be made. We do expect to choose the slightly slopey engineeringly conflicted site uh, as the safest option to actually be able to, to get going on. Um, but I could be talking through my hat because the board meeting has not yet completed. I am not in it and I'm not 100% sure what, what the answer will be, but we will certainly have an answer by the end of, of today. Um, in terms of the use of Warrington, yes, we do understand that it is um, it is quite a, a, a drive a, a away from Holyhead. Uh, however, it is available as an option. And I also believe at the moment um, HMRC colleagues are also looking to stand up the Road King option that we had um, last year as well, so that people will have more than one choice, uh, pr assuming that Holyhead is, is, is not yet operational, so that we will have two standby um, options. Uh, as, as well as um, hoping to get Hollyhead open for, um, in particular, by by July um, it, for for SPS checks. Um, but in in the meantime, the only the only checks that will need to be being done are, are transit, and obviously they are smaller, take less time, and and sh should hold up fewer fewer people. So I think we're reasonably confident that we have the capacity. Um, it's just not going to be perhaps quite as convenient and as smooth as um, as the eventual uh, solution. But obviously, as I'm sure you're aware, because um, the Hollyhead site is a devolved responsibility, um, it, it, it becomes a two handed process to do anything um, with, with devolved um, uh, agreements in place. And so it has it has taken slightly longer to get into the position that we, we would have wanted to be in. Um, if there is any more information that we can share before the end of, of the day or indeed uh, follow up with as part of the follow up Q&A. I'm happy to do so, but just to give you that, that's the live as of this minute picture. Yeah, well, that's great. That's great. So without uh, wanting to jinx it, you can't believe everything that you read in the newspapers. Indeed. Uh, yeah. So the other thing is uh, Operation Brock only applies to the Kent ports you wouldn't necessarily envisage it even being possible to have a an Anglesey or Wales entry permit. Uh, no, that is not the plan. Um, it's just for Kent as uh, the majority of traffic obviously goes through um, the short straight ports. Um, but we're working very closely with the local resilience for forums in uh, England and then the devolved administrations um, also on their local traffic management plans to share, you know, intelligence and analysis to make sure that they're fully prepared for um, the changes and um, uh, the end of the transition period. So yes, we're working very closely with them, but um, the check and HGV ready service is um, it's a, a legal requirement in Kent, but for other ports, we recommend it just to help businesses prepare um, and have that kind of um, checklist. Uh, to check against um, and then hopefully that will also help improve their kind of readiness and understanding too but it's not only a legal requirement in Kent. Okay, okay. Yes, um, I can see one question um, that's come in I, I don't think it applies to a lot of tonnage but and it's slightly technical it's just apart from Kent and road transport what about international shipments into the UK airports which then come by road into Ireland. So this would be something that is flown in perhaps to Manchester and then and then brought through Holyhead. 
So I think it's mainly a, a customs related question, Margaret. Mm. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, David will be joining us later for the plenary session, but there is, um, and I, I, I do note the, please don't just refer us to gov.uk, but at the risk of driving the audience mad, there is a, an Annex D in the border operating model, which covers air movements. And so it talks about the, I mean, it does refer to pretty much the movements between the EU and um, Great Britain, but I think goods coming into the airport, and David can correct me at the plenary session, coming into the uh, GB airports and then moving on to Ireland would could move on then using transit and other things as well but they would need to have some customs procedures to move on from GB to Ireland but okay. there is a nice annex there in which will get you started in the border operating model with a cup of tea. Yeah yeah and uh, there's a further question which relates to a lorry's transiting Northern Ireland presumably along the A5 um, between Donegal and County Louth, uh, or, or indeed County Monaghan, uh, will there be any constraints? I, let, let me come back to you a little bit more about that. It's that, it's that movement, isn't it? If I presume it's going in, dipping into Northern Ireland on yeah. the way from Donegal to Dundalk. So, um, yes, yeah, so let me double check that for you and come back to you at the plenary session. But. Um, again, it's something that Mark and Ellie would have covered this morning. <laughs> OK, I think that pretty much covers it. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Neil. Um, and we're now going to hand over to uh, our colleague from the um, Department of Business um, and Benedict Lucan is going to take us through that and then we'll have a, a short Q&A with Sharon Higgins, um, the Executive Director of Member Services from IBEC. Thank you, Benedict. Thanks very much, Margaret. Hi everybody, I'm Ben Lucan. I'm from the Goods Regulation Team here at the UK Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. First slide, please. So the primary focus of my presentation is going to be about placing goods on the GB market. So we're talking about manufactured goods here and we're talking about England, Scotland and Wales. Uh, my colleague Laura is also on the line who will be around to help assist with any questions we might have on manufactured goods regulation and the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. So again, the focus is about placing manufactured goods on the market here rather than specifically the movement of those goods. So as a manufacturer, the first thing to do is check which regulations apply to your product. Uh, so the key thing we're going to cover here and the big change relates to new approach goods. So these are ones that typically bear the CE marking and are regulated by directives at EU level which set out the essential requirements. So for toys, it'd be not being a choking hazard and the relevant harmonised standards that can be used to achieve compliance. This is again going to be the focus here because I'm going to talk a lot about UKCA and the use of that marking for placing goods on the GB market. So further examples of new approach goods could be machinery or personal protective equipment. You'll see the second on the list there is old approach goods. And this refers to those which are regulated on a sectoral basis with standalone modules of EU regulation. So things like cars, medicines, chemicals and aerospace. Changes in these areas are going to be specific to the goods you are selling. The third one down there on the list is non harmonised goods. And what I'm referring to here are those that are subject to national rather than EU wide product rules. So in GB furniture would be an example. The big change from the beginning of next year is that mutual recognition no longer applies to these goods. So if you're exporting to GB, you'll need to make sure that you meet national requirements if you're placing them on the market. Next slide. So. If you've already placed CE mark goods on the UK market before the 1st of January next year, so during the current transition period, you don't have to do anything and these can circulate freely until they reach their end user. There are two big changes to note here. One is the introduction of the new UKCA mark, which will come into effect to replace the CE marking for placing goods on the GB market. The essential requirements and standards required will be the same, so the, the switch over shouldn't be too difficult from the outset. We recognise that this is quite a big change for businesses, so most CE mark goods to smooth the transition 
can continue to be placed on the GB market until the 1st of January 2022, so for next year. I say most, and what I'm referring to are some exceptions, so it is longer in some cases, such as medical devices, and they can be placed on the GB market with the CE market until the 30th of June 2023, for example. There is a slight correct to this, so it's only CE mark goods that have been self-certified, or those which have a certificate, certificate, uh, certificate of conformity from an EU notified body that can be placed on the GB market until the 1st of January 2022. If that certificate is from a UK body, you'll need to start using the UKCA mark straight away from the 1st of January next year because the EU will not be recognising UK notified bodies. Next slide. I'm going to talk a bit more about the label quickly of UKCA. So UKCA means UK conformity assessed. And if you use the marking, you'll need to draw up a UK declaration of conformity. And the, informa the information that's required there is essentially the same as what's needed on an EU declaration of conformity, except you'll need to refer to UK legislation, not EU legislation. You can use the UKCA marking and the CE marking on the same product if it is destined for both the GB and E markets. This is fine as long as the product meets the requirements of both markets and neither marking impedes the visibility of the other one. Next slide. The big thing to note with conformity assessment bodies is that UK notified bodies, as they're currently called, from next year, these are going to be called approved bodies. And we're working on our own database, which will list all of these. But to find out the details, you can still check the EU NANDO database, which stands for the New Approach Notified and Designated Organisations database. Or you can actually check the UK Accreditation Service website. If your product requires third party assessment, this will need to be done by a UK approved body from the 1st of January 2022. But we suggest you plan well in advance of this date. The big change for the EU market is from the beginning of next year, conformity assessments, as I've mentioned, carried out by UK bodies won't be recognised in the EU and you will need separate UK and EU certificates. In terms of the impact of the UK EU negotiations, what that means is if there is a mutual recognition agreement, you will be able to get your products assessed by conformity assessment bodies in each other's markets. However, this doesn't mean that the markings will be recognised. It doesn't necessarily mean that, well, it doesn't mean that UKCA is going to be recognised in the EU. It just means that EU bodies could assess against UKCA. The, the key takeaway here is that negotiations aren't going to bring about a situation where the new UKCA marking is not needed anymore. Next slide. So this one here is really just to restate the key actions that you need to take to ensure your products are market compliant. And if you use third party conformity assessment, you should contact your notified body as soon as possible to understand options for assessment for both you, for both the GB and EU markets. Next slide. A key change coming into effect next year is the impacts on legal, the legal responsibilities of economic operators. So some EU distributors of GB goods will become importers and some GB distributors of goods will become importers as well. So what this means from the beginning of next year, if you become an importer, you'll need to indicate your name and address on the product packaging or on an accompanying document. Uh, you'll need to keep a copy of the declaration of conformity and ensure the technical documentation can be made available on request. There are also other responsibilities which are listed on the placing goods, manufactured goods on the GB market on the Gov website, which we can include a link to after. There's an easement with regards to this, this as well uh, on the GB side, which is that you can include the imported details on an accompanying document until 2023. That easement does not apply on the EU side. It's purely unilateral on our side. Next slide, please. So this is just to summarise some of the changes for placing old approach goods on the GB market. So I touched upon the distinction at the beginning, but again, these are the ones that are typically high risk products with detailed sectoral models of regulation and chemicals has already been covered by my colleagues. And uh, I think the thing to the key guidance in this area, again, 
on the placing good manufactured goods on the GB market and gov includes the sectoral guidance related to aerospace, automotive and medicines. And these are links we can make available to you after the presentation today. Next slide. So this really just sums up the actions you need to take as a business. So you should check which regulations apply to your goods and make sure you have all the relevant approvals, markings, certifications as soon as possible. That's the end of my presentation and happy to move on to Q&A now. Hello. Hi, Sharon Higgins here. Hi. Hi, sorry, I wasn't sure if I was live there or not. Um, thanks, Benedict, appreciate all of that there. I suppose from our perspective, we have 38 trade associations, so I know based on all of the conversations I've heard so far this morning, there'll be lots of um, information circulated right throughout those. And your point in the last uh, comments there around the specific sectoral sides, I think will be very important. So we'll be um, certainly working with those. A few specific questions here. Um, so standards, first of all, uh, could you please comment on standardization cooperation from the 1st of January 2021? Will BSI cooperation with SEN, Senelec and ETSI continue after their currently agreed transition period to 31st of December? Yes, yeah, so that's correct. BSI will be participating until right. the 30th, 31st of December 2021, but BSI is a private body and okay. ultimately is a matter between them and the European standardization organizations, but we expect they would continue to participate after 2021. Okay, okay, uh, thank you for that. The next one is the UK CA marking can be used from the 1st of January 21. However, to allow business time to adjust to the new requirements, they will still be able to use the CE marking from the 1st of January 2022 in most cases. Is this deadline fixed or expected that some goods can continue to use the EU CE mark after the 2021 grace period? Yeah, so to clarify, the UK CA marking comes into effect next year, so it can be used from the beginning of next year. Recognising the you know, impact that could have on businesses, there is an easement to smooth the transition, which is to allow CE marked goods to be placed on the GB market until the end of next year, so throughout 2021. From 2022 onwards, the UKCA marking will be mandatory in most cases. Okay. I mentioned in my presentation that there is an exception to the time frame, and that would be, you know, for example, medical devices, where it's the 30th of June 2023, by which the C marking can still be placed on the products. Uh, so there's there's no expectation on on our part that the grace period, if you like, as you've described it, will be extended. So you know, C marking next year for goods is is fine in most cases unless, and this is this is a qualification that's important, if there's a good that has a certificate of conformity from a UK notified body, you'll have to use UKCA straight away. So okay. self-certified CE or your certificates from the EU body, you can place it on the market until the end of next year. Okay, um, that's clear. Thank you, Benedict. And um, we've one question here in the chat bar. Will manufacturers also, sorry, it's two, I'm looking back here. Um, will there be a tariff on raw materials imported from ROI from UK? Actually, I think that was from earlier. Yeah, sorry, just going back here through the questions again. Will manufacturers also need a UK-based representative name and address on products? Could that be an alternative if they have multiple importers into the UK? Yeah, so if if the product, for example, is, is not being sent directly to the end user and it's being distributed in, in GB, there will need to be importer. Uh, there will need to be the importer address on the product or packaging. Uh, okay. So essentially, what we what we, uh, to to allow that to be a bit easier from the start of next year until 2023, that could be on the accompanying document. So anything that goes with the product until it reaches its end user. Okay. Um. What will uh What will manufacturers already self certified CE marking? need to do to be able to use the UK CA marking? Yeah, so if you self-certify for CE, you can self-certify for UK CA. As okay. I mentioned, the essential requirements and standards are the same. The thing the thing to keep track of is, you know, whether there is any divergence in standard in the essential requirements next year. We don't plan to make any radical changes, but it's worth keeping an eye out for that divergence if possible. And if, and if there is divergence, you need to 
self-certify for UKCA on the basis of those rules. So if there are any changes, you need to take account of that. OK, perfect. Maybe just a very last kind of general question, I guess, in relation to retail. Um, can you give any broad advice to retail businesses? So I know that one of the key challenges faced by retail businesses, particularly with, with importing, is, you know, bringing in pallets of goods and, you know, being able to provide importer details for each of those. I think that the key thing to note is making sure that you, you find a way to label individual goods with importer details so that they reach their end user. And it's finding a way to do that that suits your business and your business model most effectively. But, you know, in terms of advising individual businesses, we'd, we'd, we, we, we can't do that. We'd always encourage a business to speak to their trade association, a business advisor or, or their solicitor potentially. OK, fantastic. That's it from me. Thank you, Benedict. And again, we will certainly be talking to all the trade associations we work with um, here in IBEC on the details. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for all the great inputs there. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Ben. Um, I think you've all had a lot of information to assimilate, so we thought we'd take a 10 minute break and rejoin again at 12 o'clock, um, where um, uh, we're going to run through some practical case studies for you, which I probably uh, will answer many of the questions you've got and perhaps even raise some more. So um, if you'd like to all take a break and we'll see you again at 12. Thank you very much. Welcome back, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, staying with us. Um, now we're going to move on to a session that tries to bring um, all of the presentations that you've heard to life a little bit. We're going to um, I'm going to quickly run through uh, a couple of introductory slides and then we're going to move on to some case studies. We're going to move some goods from GB to Ireland and then some uh, pottery, I think it's the example we're using, and then we're going to move some um, meat from Ireland, some chicken from Ireland to GB in January, April and um, July. Um, uh, we, these case studies are, are working well for us and with a big thank you to colleagues from DEFRA and very much so to our colleagues from Irish Revenue who are joining us today and I've got um, Carol Ann to join me in the presentations but if Natasha if you're ready if we can have the next slide please thank you we just run through a couple of outlines. Um, I think this is just a little bit of a reminder. At the moment, you'll all be aware and ha having a, had a sneak view at the results of the polls earlier, um, we can see how aware you all are. But things will change on the 1st of January that from um, moving from having an invoice and a ticket for the ferry, you now need to possibly have up to nine additional procedures, if depending on the goods you're moving and your uh, position in the supply chain. Um, we realise this is quite a, a bit of work and preparation involved um, and we expect uh, many companies to be employing agents and so on. But we think everybody should be aware by now that it all starts with an export declaration, be that from the GB or EU, and then builds on from there. On the next slide, um, we're going to uh, we've developed a, a diagram. It's not the prettiest thing in the world. Um, I recognise that we've got a bit of work to do with our uh, comms friends, I think, on it, but it just is there to uh, to demonstrate the flow of goods. So if you're importing to Great Britain in January, you won't need an entry summary declaration, but you might or others might need to do on the top line these uh, these stages. You'd need to notify that it's um, uh, leaving, you need to declare an iPath, you'd need to maybe think about temporary storage declarations and other phytosanitary controls. If you're exporting from Great Britain, again, export declarations and so on, importing to the EU. So we will be sharing these slides with you, time to go through them, but this is just to demonstrate the different stages. So that one shows the 1st of January on um, the 1st of April, which is the next one, I think. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, again, there's a, a summary here. Again, you don't need an entry summary declaration, but you're starting to think about pre-notification of certain goods. And our colleagues in DEFRA will be, have talked us through a lot of that. Um, and of course, if you're using the entry in declarants records, if you're a GB importer or your importer is, you'll need to be thinking about supplementary declarations within six months. And then on the final display of this, we've got the position as at the 1st of July. This isn't meant to terrify everybody, but just to show that it's all 
required at this point. There will be entry summary declarations required and all of these other customs procedures. This is just a sort of a visual aid really to help bring it home for you. On the next slide. Um, again, as I said, uh, I think we are at the risk of driving you mad. We're just bringing home this message that there is a need to prepare. Um, and at the end of the transition period, it all starts with an export declaration. Although the uh, Great Britain and UK is taking a staged approach to imports, that is not the case in the EU. You will need to meet all of the requirements there. And I know Caroline will, um, will, will reaffirm that, I'm sure. Next slide, please, Tasha. Um, this is, slide is um, our first case study. Appreciate it's not the prettiest in the world, but um, they are there to, to demonstrate to you the stages that need to take place to move uh, something like pottery from Great Britain to Ireland. So if I start off in what happens in Great Britain and ask uh, Carol Ann to come in at the, the key points for Ireland, if that's all right. Thank you very much. Um, so in this uh, particular example, we have Patricia. She's a Staffordshire based pottery firm. She um, uh, produces pottery. She is um, going to be doing her own exports and she has had an order in from Hugh, uh, a restaurant owner in Dublin. Um, she started to take the necessary steps. She's registered for her GB EORI number and she's ensured that her goods comply with EU labelling and marketing rules. Um, she submits a customs and merge safety and security export declaration. And she waits for uh, HMRC to uh, grant her permission to progress. She submits her customs declaration or export declaration, which is a combined declaration with the safety and security export declaration, and she waits for her per permission to progress. Um, the government uh, assesses the declaration, um, HMRC, and either grants permission to progress or asks for the goods to be presented um, at a designated location for any checks before proceeding to port. In our example, permission to progress is granted. Meanwhile, in Ireland, if I can hand over to Carol Ann. <laughs> Thanks, Margaret. Uh, well, Hugh, who's the Irish importer, and uh, he has an Irish URI number, and we'll have at this stage then we'll have we'll do up the import declaration and we'll submit that into revenues AIS or automated import system. And um, on the input of that, there's a generated a movement, a master reference number or an MRN. And Hugh will share that uh, with Chris's uh, Chris's company, who is the uh, the haulage firm. So um, Chris then is the driver and the, he pick up the goods um, from the warehouse and uh, the haulage company in this case will be doing the safety and security entry summary declaration into Ireland's ICS system. And again, on submission of the safety and security declaration into ICS, uh, there'll be an, a master reference number, an MRN generated with that. So now Chris now has two, um, uh, there are two MRNs associated with this movement. Thank you. Um, so when Chris has loaded the goods, he, he must make sure that the movement reference numbers that he needs um, to get, exit the border. So he's leaving from one of the Western ports in Great Britain to head to Dublin or Ross Lair. Um, and uh, he has completed the check HGV. He's ready to cross the border service and he's confirmed that he, he's got the OK. The he doesn't need a pass to leave from um, Western ports, but he has he's satisfied that he has the documentation he needs um, to leave and he drives to the ferry port. And then for the Irish systems. And then, so he satisfied himself on the uh, HMRC side, so now he needs to satisfy himself for uh, entry into Ireland. So Chris's firm, so that's the haulage company, will complete the pre-boarding notification on the Irish Customs Rural Service. I mentioned already about having the two MRNs the, for the ENS and for the import declaration and their input into the, the PBN. 
the, the reference number from that pre-boarding notification is provided to the ferry operator that forms part of the booking um, details. Um, so prior to going to the ferry, Chris should check the status of the pre-boarding notification and uh, that he has that good to check in status. So when uh, Chris gets to the ferry check in, um, that he present the PBN ID to the ferry operator and that operator then will check, will interact with revenue and confirm that they have a good to check in status. And in the happy flow here, the good to check in status is there and Chris gets to board the ferry. And at 30 minutes out um, before arriving into Ireland, revenue will have opened up the channel lookup service on the customs Roro and Chris can check and see then what channel has been assigned to that vehicle. Following uh, analysis, remote analysis and electronic analysis, um, in this instance, what we're saying is that this particular um, declarations have been given a green routing. So the, the channel for that vehicle then is uh, to exit the port. So when Chris um, disembarks from the ferry, they follow the signage and leave the port and um, deliver the goods to Hugh. And in this case, as Hugh doesn't have a deferred account, all customs duty is paid prior to the goods being released. So prior to the vehicle leaving the ferry um, terminal um, and leaving customs supervision, all customs duty will have been paid. But Hugh will manage the VAT liability using the postponed accounting facility that is being uh, operated in Ireland with, um, from 1 January on. Thank you. Um, so not the prettiest slide in the world, but we think we, we've covered all the detail there, I think, haven't we? <laughs> and so we, um, in recognising that, that this is the movement of standard goods, this is, a, I suppose we could say it's quite straightforward examples, <laughs> but a lot of steps. Um, moving on to the next slide, we're moving on to um, something a little bit more complex now. Uh, you'll recall, of course, that the uh, Great Britain is taking a staged approach to imports. So what we're trying to bring out in these next three slides is those stages. If you were to start to um, export chicken from Ireland uh, as meat to Great Britain. So we're doing the first stage in late January, the second stage in eight after April and the final stage after July, after the 1st of July. So um, if Caroline is ready, if we can start with Damien, who is a uh, an exporter based in Ireland, um, sending chicken to Clare in Great Britain. Indeed, yeah. So again, with a full load of chicken leaving Ireland, Damien, has his uh, YORI number, so submits the export declaration um, uh, into AP. He's, as we say in the slides here, Damien has agreed the terms and conditions with Claire, so that the responsibility for border formalities are clear. Um, Damien doesn't need an export health certificate as the movement to, to GB is before the 1st of April 2021. So Damien will put the export declaration to Ireland's um, customs system called AAP, the Automated Entry Processing System. They, they will be generated from AAP, a master reference number, an MRN for that export declaration. The haulage company here is Joe's company. They have taken responsibility for doing the pre-boarding notification. So um, they will put this MRN into the pre-boarding notification and the pre-boarding notification ID is provided to the ferry operator as part of the booking details. Um, it, I should have mentioned earlier that Claire is going to take advantage of the staged approach in Great Britain and she is going to make an entry in her records in, when the goods arrive in the UK and take the six months um, time limit before she submits her supplementary declaration and um, pays any VAT or pays any tariffs. So I should say so um, to do to just in case Joe is stopped at the border, what he'll need is Claire's EORI number her. Um, so he has that um, to show if he's asked that she is taking this um, and she's making an entry in her records. OK, so um, so along with um, Claire's EORI number, 
Joe, the haulage company, then the driver has the PBN ID, which is the pre-boarding notification ID. And before going to the port in Ireland, they will check the status at that PBN to make sure that they have a good check in status. So um, if we move on maybe to nine, Margaret, you've probably covered eight, yeah. have you there? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so at nine then, Joe presents the PBN ID to the ferry operator, a check-in, and as we've said, there's a good check-in status and Joe is allowed to board the ferry and the ferry operator then communicates that PBN ID back to Irish Customs, so we're able to confirm export of those goods out of the European Union. So at, at this stage, um, Joe it makes the crossing from Ireland to Great Britain and there is no uh, GVMS system to um, in place for imports of this nature at that stage. So and the truck is not stopped for checks when it arrives at the GB port. It's also worth noting that uh, Joe, um, as the carrier, will not have to submit a safety and security declaration for the, the GB import. So the truck is not stopped and Joe drives to Claire's warehouse. Um, Claire's checks the tariff rates and once the goods arrive, she updates her entry in her own records with the detail of the import. Um, and she, I think David listed earlier on all of the records that she should note in her records, but she notes the time and date of entry. Claire is registered for VAT and so she can use the postponed VAT accounting to account for the import VAT and she must pay this quarterly. This cannot be delayed for the six months. But um, the six months uh, from 23rd January, she has six months then before she has to submit her supplementary declaration. She submits this then before the 23rd of July 2021. Um, and as she has registered for a duty deferment account, this will be debited after she submits her supplementary declaration. So that covers the movement of this chicken from the 23rd of January 2021. Uh, Claire has quite an appetite for chicken, so she wants another load of chicken in April. Um, so, uh, Tasha, if we could move to the next slide, thank you. What we've done here uh, before I've highlighted in red the boxes. I hope you can see them. I appreciate the, um, the comments are not perfect on this, but we've highlighted in red where there will be changes at April. So, um, at point one and two, remain the same. Is that correct, Carol? That is yeah. correct. Yes, yeah, nothing changes in Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> Just to check. And um, at point number three, so at this stage, uh, Damien does need to apply for an export health certificate because an export health certificate will be required in GB. Um, and a, and a, vet, a vet will inspect the goods and issue the export health certificate. Um, Damien will need to send an electronic copy of this to Claire. Um, and then um, I Shall I skip on to six? What do you think? Yeah. yeah. So um, Joe needs Claire's important Iori number as he did before. At this stage, he also needs the original export health certificate. He should carry that with him. Meanwhile, Claire in GB has registered on the UK IPATH system that Lee talked you through earlier. Um, she has submitted the pre-notification of this import and uploaded an electronic copy of the export health certificate, which Damien sent her some time ago. So that's all in place. Yeah. Um, I think the Damien moves through um, through the port and uh, arrives as he's moving through, the documents are checked remotely. And again, the truck is not stopped for checks at a GB port. So anything you wanted to add, Caroline? No, I suppose really just to highlight the importance that the EHC has to accompany back at eight there, Margaret, that it must accompany the goods. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Um, again, no safety and security declaration required for the GB import. And um, in this case, Claire has six months from this import to submit her supplementary declaration. So she has six months from the 23rd of April. So she can do that up until the 23rd of October. And the chicken is safely ensconced in the warehouse, ready for consumption. And then um, the final stage of this example here is moving on to April, sorry, July. I'm getting lost with those July. So we fast forward to July next year, 2021, 23rd of July. 
And again, from the first uh, stage from January, again, number three here stays the same um, with Damien sending an electronic copy of the EHC to Claire. Um, as Carol Ann says, it's important that this uh, accompanies the goods, so she will send that to the driver um, of the haulage firm. Again, Claire has registered on the IPAF system, submitted the pre-notification, um, and she has the, the difference here really, one of the first differences here is that the six months uh, is up is up for the uh, delaying of declarations in this way. So Claire um, quite liked this way of working, so she applied separately to be approved for the simplified procedures. And she has chosen to submit a simplified declaration when the goods are imported into Great Britain rather than an entry in uh, her own record. So she submits this simplified declaration using the chief system. She'd have to have software to do that or a badge. So she submits this supplementary declaration into the chief system and she's issued with an entry reference number. Um, she provides this entry reference number to Joe's firm. Um, and Joe then submits the um, entry summary declaration, that six months um, moratorium, if you like, on entry summary declarations ends from the 1st of July. So he, as the carrier, needs to hear his firm need to submit that safety and security declaration on the SNS GB system. He does this um, and he also submits the ERN reference number. The other change from July is that, of course, the um, if assuming that the port that he's traveling through is operating a pre-lodgement model, the GVMS system will be, the Goods Vehicle Movement Service system will be in place from the 1st of July to help to, to manage and control this. So Joe's firm submits the ERN and the Safety and Security Declaration into GVMS and they um, get a movement reference number. They also put in the vehicle reference number and Joe, if anything changes between the warehouse, if you like, and the port, he can update those changes in the Goods Vehicle Movement Service. Caroline, is there anything you wanted to add at this stage? OK, or maybe even just to highlight, Margaret, is that the requirements then to do the GVMS would be a YORI number yes. for the Irish, for Joe then. Mm -hmm. And obviously to do the ENS, it is access to the software to use a broker, to use an agent for the software uh, for the HMRC's ICS system. Absolutely, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Joe's so done all of that. Yeah. All prepared. <laughs> okay. um, in this case, then, Joe, having done the GVMS system and gone through the uh, Irish system, he makes the crossing. And he has checked that the to point of entry has a border control post that deals with poultry. Um, and there's a code there that I've just included and we can check that. Um, so he's come through the port. Um, the goods movement reference number and the export health certificates are checked remotely by the uh, respective systems. And if the goods are selected by customs or the port health authority, Joe will have to stop at the BCP. He will be notified on the crossing by GVMS if it's custom stops. Or, um, in this case, again, happy journey. Uh, Joe is not stopped and he drives to Claire's warehouse. So um, in the later stages then for Claire, the thing, what's changed really is that um, she doesn't have to make an entry in her own records. As you recall, she did a simplified declaration. Um, and she will need to submit her supplementary declaration then by the fourth working day of the month after the date of import. So she needs to have submitted her supplementary declaration before the 5th of August 2021. And in the same way as before, she's registered for a duty deferment account. So the uh, account is debited after she has submitted the supplementary declaration. Anything else you wanted to add, Caroline? No, I think that's covered. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, we hope that's helped to bring things to life. And I know that we have a, um, a session now with uh, questions and answers that we might not have covered already. Um, and I know that we'll have my colleagues, I think, back from HMRC and from DEFRA, who will be able to go into more detail about these case studies if you have any questions. And, and I think, sorry, Margaret, I should have mentioned that we said we wouldn't cover Landbridge Transit today. Exactly. 
Yes, and maybe have a future session on it because you can see how complex the screen is for a simple import and export and then that we'll handle a land bridge um, movement in a subsequent event. Absolutely, I think yes, we we want to. Uh, there's so we recognise the importance of the land bridge, and we wanted to give it its uh, the time it deserves, rather than to squash it into a session like this. So um, and come cover all the areas. So we will we will come back to you and do some land bridge movements and address all the exciting issues as that made. I know I recognise, of course, that we've touched on a number of it today in earlier presentations, but <laughs> there will be more. We recognise. But as Caroline says, a good case study would be very helpful, I think, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, I think now we were going to move on to a plenary session. Um, so I, while I uh, have a look at that, I'll just pick up a couple of questions that came in earlier. And I think, um, if I'm correct, we've got our colleagues back from HMRC and we've got colleagues in from DEFRA who are uh, animal and plant experts. Is that correct, Natasha? Yes, I think all the experts are back on the line now. That's fabulous. OK, well, um, if I cover off a couple of more straightforward ones that I've seen um, coming through. So um, we were asked about tariffs and tariffs come into play from the 1st of January. The uh, UK has published its global tariffs and um, we will send and post a link to those for you um, in the chat. I think um, other questions that I saw were um, about wood packaging and Lee, correct me if uh, I'm wrong, but we are happy to confirm are we that all wood packaging has to be ISPM 15 compliant. Yeah, it's uh, Jason again from sort of the plant health side. So yes, Sorry, all, all, all WPM uh, moving to either the Republic of Ireland or back into into GB will be required to be ISPM 15 compliant. Uh, but just to note that we, from the GB side at least, will continue to sort of implement our risk-based uh, regime uh, in terms of inspections on those goods. So in, in effect, uh, it's no different to sort of what currently happens with sort of third country imports. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and um, would we be able to confirm, Jason, whether export health certificates are required from GB to NI at this stage? If, uh, so GB to, to NI from a, a phytosanitary uh, perspective, yeah, um, a phytosanitary certificate will be required from GB to NI. Thank you. Um, and um, apologies if I've missed it, but the border control post. So we want, there's a question about whether products of animal origin would come through Fishguard or Pembroke. And um, when are we publishing what border control posts will publish what goods or will accept what goods? Hi, so, um, Silbury here from Defra. Yeah. Sorry, I I'm, I'm sure. don't someone will correct me if I'm wrong here, but I I'm not sure that, that information um, is available currently. I know the, the, the team working on the BCPs um, are, are still um, accepting applications for, for any sort of changes that may need to be made to BCPs, but it should be something that we'll be able to, to send out to you in, in the future. So I think we'll have to take that one away. But whoever was going to come in there, please do, do correct me if you have more up to date information. Yeah, sorry, Jack, it's Lee here. Um, that is that's correct. Um, but just say there is a there is a list on gov.uk um, which isn't up to date, but it will be updated before the end of the transition period. So just keep an eye on gov.uk. Thank you. Um, and I have had an answer from Ellie and Mark. If you recall, we had a question about moving goods from Donegal to Dundalk and maybe dipping into Northern Ireland. Um, the, the answer is that uh, uh, there are no customs processes required between goods moving from Republic of Ireland to NI, so there wouldn't be a need to do transit movements or customs processes if that route was taken. Um, other questions that uh, I had, um, I think there was a question, um, David, if we've got you on the phone about people were applying for IORI numbers and um, they, uh, they, I think the uh, there's some issues with getting through to that. I think the answer is that you need to have a government gateway account and you can apply for a government gateway account uh, without being resident 
in the UK, is that correct? Um, yes, um, I'll have to double check the gateway stuff, but I, I do remember in the past um, actually helping uh, um, some EU businesses to apply there and then on, on a, a physical industry day, um, which obviously was last year now. Um, but yeah, you, you should be able to apply for for one just with that that information. And it, it doesn't it shouldn't take too long either. Thank you. Um, thank you, David. And uh, I see DEFRA colleagues, we have a, a follow up question about wood packaging. Does it need to be heat treated from NI to GB? At the moment, obviously, because uh, it's, so it's still under negotiation at the minute, so uh, I can't comment on that one at the moment, I'm afraid. OK, thank you. We'll come back to you then. Um, yes, I, I, I noticed that. Sorry, we, we try to. Uh, there's a question here about a glossary of terms and abbreviations. I, I believe there is one at the back of the border operating model, um, and I uh, apologise um, that we tend to use abbreviations. We try to check ourselves, but uh, we will we will do better. Um, and as I said, we will be sharing the slides with you uh, afterwards, so you'll be able to to work through them. Um, let me see. Uh, other questions that I had noted would be, I think, um, Defra colleagues, I think if we covered all the labelling questions that we've been asked in the Q&A, that we've covered the P&O box, have we, and the NI to EU labelling questions. Should I take that as a yes? Leah, the team, have anything more to say about labelling, do let me know. Um, questions now. David Lee, were there others that you picked up that you were going to cover? Wanted to yep, there, there was one that I was just going to cover um, that I remember spotting uh, earlier on, but didn't have the, the time to answer as I had to nip off onto another call. It was around uh, someone asking about inward um, inward processing and, and those kind of things. Um, what it's worth saying across all uh, all special procedures is that, that we do anticipate that we'd continue to, to operate the, the very special procedure regimes at the end of, uh, of at the end of the transition period. But, but the exact arrangements for that, uh, that that will be in place will depend um, on, the, on the terms of, of the future relationship with the EU. So some of the uh, negotiation outcomes. Um, but as I say, is it, we do anticipate to, to operate those, those special procedures. And at the risk of um, incurring your wrath again by sending you off to gov.uk, there is quite a bit of detail about those in the board operating model and on gov.uk about the requirements. Isn't there? Um, and I think um, we had a few more specialised questions, but I think as one of our earlier facilitators said, we will be gathering up all of these questions, um, producing fuller answers for you and sharing them back out through the embassy and through IBEC. Um, so we will be able to, to cover them for you. So don't be shy. If there are more questions that you want to ask us while, we've, while you've got us here, please do. So I scroll up and down the Q&A. It's so much easier being in a room at these events where you can put your hand up and see what we are and have a conversation about it. But uh, we get there. And I think um, I think, David, you covered this earlier briefly in an answer, but we've been asked again about what does conduct by conduct mean in terms of customs for empty and reusable packaging? So I'm not sure exactly how it will look for for reusable packaging, but um, a good example of what uh, declaration by conduct is it's it's what we all used to do at airports quite often um, where you go through either the the green lane that says nothing to declare or the red lane where you you do have something to declare that's an example of it and um, so it might just be a case of um, by by saying it's just empty packaging or not declaring at all it's um, it's that it's sometimes referred to as declaration by any other means than, than an actual physical declaration. So it can be verbally, it can be by by choosing a, a certain lane. Um, but as I say, I'm not quite sure exactly what that conduct will look like for empties, but um, but that kind of gives you a bit of a flavour of what that looks like. Thank you. Um, 
possibly straying into negotiation territory here, but uh, and do let us know if we are, David. But is there any update on mutual recognition of AEO between the UK and the EU? Um, not. I, I no, basically I don't have an update on that at this at this point. But as you say, it, uh, potentially straying a little bit into the negotiation territory that uh, and I'm not fully up to speed with um, today. Um, and I think we have a uh, somebody may have missed the answer that you gave on customs declaration. So yes, if it's for repairs that's inward processing and those facilitations will still be available. But I think if you said, David, that you need you may need to be uh, established in the UK for some of them. Yeah, for, for, for some of the, the special procedures and, and some uh, they are the whole regime is still dependent partly on um, or different elements of it on on the um, similar to AEO on the outcomes of the negotiation around mutual recognition of those different um, those different special procedures. Okay, thank you. And I think you had a number of questions earlier about duty delivered paid um, and, the, and the implications there for exporters from Ireland. Um, did you cover all of those? Were there other th points that you wanted to make about that? Um, not at this stage, other than it's that that is a key one for for those in the supply chain to to talk to each other and to, to establish what needs to be done if that is the the desired route that you want to continue doing delivery deliver uh, DDP always struggle to pronounce that fully um, and and what uh, what needs to be done if you do decide to do that because obviously uh, becoming established in um, in another country can have other ramifications regarding tax um, mm -hmm. but it's one of those ones that you do need if you are considering it have a look at the inco terms think about what other potential ramifications there might be um, and, and have those discussions about what, who, who's going to have the responsibility in those supply chains or, or what assistance you can have to, to make sure the relevant people have the right information um, to be able to make the declarations. But again, lots of this comes down to um, commercial decisions for, for different organisations and, and different pa um, parties in that supply chain of, uh, of what they, they're willing to take on and, and what that means for their, um, their, their terms of, of um, terms and conditions and, and anything like that. So uh, it, it is something to, to consider, but it might mean changes to, to, to that supply chain and how that works. Sorry, having held up for some time, my system decided to dip out for a moment. <laughs> Bear with me. Right, so um, there was, I think there was another question on the follow up on the gateway accounts. Um, do, can they be company specific, David, or user specific? I think you can have both. You can have one set up for your company or uh, a, an individual. Is that correct? Um, I believe so. That's something to have to double check as it's um, kind of a wider tax element mm. rather than, than customs uh, specific, as you can imagine. Uh, here at HMRC, there is a, a raft of things that we, we cover off. And, and unfortunately, I'm not a, a specialist in every every single one. <laughs> Yes, from a previous life, I, I remember a government gateway, but it does move quite a bit, the, the requirements. So I think the government gateway accounts, if memory serves, are that you can set them up as a company or as an individual. And then there's a further uh, stage that some uh, services on gov.uk will require, which is a verification system, which uh, requires um, more in-depth knowledge. But yes, do come back to us if you've got any particular issues with setting one up or um, uh, questions. Um, I think there's a question here um, that our colleagues in DEFRA may be able to help uh, with on uh, products going from Northern Ireland to health codes on labelling. Um, is there any flexibility to uh, allowing the new code to be used before that date? Is that something you can cover? Is that something we should take away? It's at 12.36. Apologies, I don't have an answer to that. I'm not sure if um, either of my other colleagues do, um, but we can take that away for sure. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question just before that asking, do we advise uh, ROI holders to continue using the land bridge? Um, yes, I mean, we're putting a lot of uh, detail in place and Mike from um, Trans Transport uh, coverage through the details in Kent, but we will um, do uh, come back to you with a more in-depth session about the land bridge and that the stages through that for you and 
that should help you to make the commercial decisions you need to make to to take those uh, routes for you. But certainly it'll be there and available for you and we'll talk you through the detail. Ah, uh, Ben, Benedict, you still with us? From what date can manufacturers start to use the UKCA mark, self-certifying? Is it operable now? Yeah, so the UKCA mark comes into force next year. So legally speaking, it's not operable right now. Uh, you can place it on your products now and that'll be fine, but it will need to accompany whatever the relevant marking is for the market you're sending to, essentially. So if you're placing it on the market right now, you, you would need to be on a product that has a CE marking because the CE marking is still the current relevant market. Uh, and uh, yeah, so for the beginning of next year, you can self-certify for it if you, for example, self-certify for CE. Okay, thank you very much. I think our questions are slowing down. And Slash, can we move to the next slide, please? Um, no such thing as a free lunch. We've given you lots of information um, and we'd like to hear from you um, as to how useful you found this. Um, it's a simple yes or no answer, but by all means, if you if you want to leave comments on Slido, by, by all means do, you can. Um, so while you're all logging back into Slido and using the hashtag BPDG to tell us how this, whether it was useful or not, um, I should let you know that thank you very much for filling in the polls earlier. You'll be pleased to know that of those of you who filled it in, 100% of you understand that things will change at the end of the transition period, which I'm not at all surprised at. Of course I'm not. And I haven't got the, the full comparison with other EU uh, events with me, but looking very good on the other question as well. 11% um, don't know what action you need to take. 14% know the actions, but don't quite know what to do next. 61% have started to take the action they need to. And four. A comfortable position for others, I hope. Um, and I hope this, this, this morning has helped you for that. Um, just before I hand over um, to uh, for closing remarks shortly. If there's no other questions coming in, um, I'm going to hand over to Fergal O'Brien from IBEC in a moment for some closing remarks. But um, if uh, Tasha, if we could move on to the next slide, please. I think you've all got these messages. Get your Yori number if you haven't got one now. Your uh, state Yori number. Get your um, GB Yori number, um, and think about activating tags and so on at the exit points um, and agree those responsibilities with your customs agents and your logistics provider. Some key actions there outlined for you. And the last slide that I have before I hand over to, to uh, Fergal to close is just a slide with some useful links for you. I appreciate the plea not to keep sending you into gov.uk but once you find your area um, and uh, I would recommend looking at the board and updates. Things are, some areas are being updated over the next few weeks. So by going into gov.uk and finding the, the particular areas of interest, you can get those updates uh, emailed to you. But some useful guides here for you. There is the um, uh, transition landing page. There's one particularly for EU businesses. Um, and there's the border operating model link there. There's a step-by-step -step guide for yourselves or those in your supply chains. Um, you've asked a lot of Really good questions today. We'll come back to you with answers, but if other things occur to you, please don't be shy. And we've included an email address of our colleagues in BPDG who uh, take in these questions and pester our colleagues across government for answers for you. So uh, please do keep your questions coming. Thank you very much. And again, no further questions in the chat box that I can see. I'll double check that I uploaded it. That's fine. So if I could hand over now to uh, Fergal O'Brien from IBEC. Um, to say some closing remarks. Thank you very much. 
Margaret, thank you, Margaret. That's been a, a marathon and a tour de force. So, so well done on, on taking all of that this morning and going through it so effectively. Um, I think it's a reflection of the content from colleagues and you, the, the volume of questions and interaction that we've had uh, this morning. So that's really, really superb. Um, so from my point of view, Margaret, it, it really is just to thank you all. Um, everything has come true from the, the board and protocol delivery group team, um, from HMRC, from all, all the government departments in the UK, and to thank Carol Arles for, for joining us from Revenue as well. But I think the case study really brings so much of this to life. Um, and um, I know as you flagged, we'll, we'll all be working on, on, on some of those charts and diagrams over the next number of months as well, because I think it really does help to, to crystallize um, all of the details and the different scenarios that, that businesses are dealing with. Um, just really like to thank the, the embassy, the ambassador and the team for, for, for bringing us all together on this. I, th I think it's been a, a most useful session from our point of view. Um, it's interesting looking at your polls, Margaret. Um, people are busy. Most people know what to do, but there's clearly a lot to be done uh, over the next 60 days and beyond, I suppose, which is going to be the other feature of this and the phasing of, of some of the arrangements, obviously, from the UK side uh, beyond the end of the year as well is, is, is that further level of detail that I know that the businesses in Ireland will need to be aware of. Um, just to thank colleagues on the IBEX side, um, Pat Ivory and Neil Willoughby in particular have been working with the Embassy on this and all of my colleagues who, who've moderated the, the sessions this morning. Um, again, we will be coming back to all of our IBEX members who joined us uh, on, on lots of the questions that we've gone through, the, the follow-ups. I know we have a number of commitments in terms of follow-up on, on, on lots of the detail. And we know that there's further information to come, both as, as negotiations um, get finalised over the next while, uh, as we look forward to that, uh, as other issues get clarified and as other guidance uh, is published and we have, we have lots of details to come back to, to people on. Uh, I know that issue of the land bridge, again, that Carlisle mentioned, uh, is one that will continue to be of particular interest to our members. And I know you, you touched on it, Margaret, a little, but this issue of moving goods uh, from Ireland through Northern Ireland, I think is something that we may come back to as well. Um, just to remind all of the IBEC members that there's lots of, again, collateral uh, on the IBEC website. We have our dedicated uh, Brexit website. Um, I think our FAQ section will be getting larger again after today, uh, and it's great to have that content. Um, we have our own trackers that we look at from an IBEC perspective on both the protocol and on the future trading relationship. And now we have a very extensive catalogue and back catalogue of webinars and sessions such as this. Um, so I think, again, there's lots of resources uh, for, for people to rely on and to access over this very busy 60 day period between now and the end of the year. So, Margaret, from our point of view, just to thank you and, and, and colleagues and everyone in the embassy, it's been an absolutely superb session this morning. We've all learned an awful lot and we know we have lots to follow up on. There's lots of more detail to be provided to business and to support to give them uh, over the coming weeks and months. Uh, but it's been a most useful session to thank you and colleagues for all the time you've given us. So thanks from everyone in Library, Margaret. Thank Thank you. Pleasure. I think we'll, we'll, we'll end the session there and thank, thank everyone for, for joining us and staying with us today. Thank you all.